Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Hampstead School Board special meeting of Tuesday, August 4th, 2020. Um, before we begin, I have a statement to read regarding um, the governor's state of emergency. As chair of the Hampstead School Board, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to executive order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. However, in accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that we are A, providing public access to the meeting by telephone. We are utilizing Zoom for this electronic meeting. All members of the board have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through this platform and the public has access to contem contemporaneously listen to this meeting by dialing the following phone number 888-475-4499 or 877-853-5257. B, providing public notice of the necessary information for accessing the meeting. We previously gave notice to the public of the necessary information for accessing the meeting, including how to access the meeting using Zoom telephonetically. Instructions have also been provided on the district website at hampsteadschools.net. C, providing a mechanism for the public to alert the public body during the meeting if there are problems with access. If anybody has a problem, please email hmstechnology at hampsteadschools.net. D, adjourning the meeting if the public is unable to access the meeting. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Um, with that in mind, Melissa, will you please call a roll call vote and members please state if you are alone in the room when you answer here. Megan Malcolm. I'm here and I'm alone in the house. Caitlin Parnell. Here, I'm alone in the room. There are other members of my family in the house. David Smith. I am here alone in the room and others are in the house. And then Mike Flynn, um, Jim Sweeney is on mute right now. And Jim Sweeney. Here, alone in the room, other members in the house. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Mike. Karen Yusenka. Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, good. I'm here in my office, and in two minutes, I'll be all alone. Bye, guys. <laughs> Thank you. And OK. Sorry, go ahead, Melissa. Sorry. Sorry, executive consultant, Dr. Ron Metzler. Hey, Melissa, I am here in my office and I am alone. There are other members of my house, uh, of my household home. Thank you, Dr. Metzler. Okay, um, the main purpose of the meeting is to obviously hear recommendations from our Safe Learning Task Force. Um, before we jump into that, um, I would like to introduce both members of the board who have not met him and members of the public. Um, Dr. Brian Cochran is also um, sitting in on our meeting this evening. He is the interim superintendent of SAU 55. Um, Dr. Cochran, I don't know if you want to say a few quick words, um, but go uh, ahead if you'd like. Just very briefly, uh, I just want to, to thank the Hampstead board and uh, let them know that I'm really looking forward to working with the board, with Dr. Metzler, uh, administration and, and teachers and staff uh, to support the community and, and the school's mission. I'm hearing some you know wonderful things going on and I, I can't wait to get in the building and meet folks and uh, uh, you know uh, get involved and uh, uh, especially work with Dr. Messler, who so I've known for a significant time. Thank you Dr. Cochran. Cochran we appreciate it. Caitlin if I could Yes, please, Dr. Yeah. Metzler. And, I, and I, too, I too would like to welcome uh, Dr. Cochran. You know, we, uh, we, we do go way back and, and we were members, uh, we met on the Ceres board uh, and I was so impressed with his work, you know, just a few years ago and I shared this with you recently, you know, I was trying to get him to, to come work for us. Uh, so he brings uh, an awful lot of uh, experience, especially with data and, and curriculum. I think, um, 
you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to do some great work together. So welcome, Brian. Uh, we're, we're happy to have you. And uh, we're certainly looking forward as well to, to working closely with you uh, during this transition year. So welcome. Thank you very much, Earl. And I've, I've certainly appreciated all the opportunities we've had to work with uh, since 2012. And, and I'm really looking forward to doing some more. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we will go to, um, I'm going to turn this right over to Dr. Metzler and Mr. Flynn. They're going to bring us information from our Safe Learning Task Force, and we will go from there. So I'll turn the floor over to you both. Okay, so we, um, so Mr. Flynn and I, we don't, we don't have a, a script. Uh, we're going to jump back and forth. So I hope that that works for folks. We, um, we have an awful lot to share with you this evening. You know, we have 40 some odd slides and a kind of a, a, an overview about where our recommendation from the Safe Learning Task Force lies. So Mike, if you want to do a, a brief introduction and I have, I have a few things to go on that first slide as well. Yeah, um, you know, real quickly, I have to be honest, I, where I live right now, the storm is going through. So if I do lose power, I have also emailed this to the administrative team so that someone can pick up. I just want to be honest on what's going on around my house right now. Okay. Um, yeah, so we, we uh, put together the, um, the Safe Learning Task Force uh, with, with, with a lot in mind, and it, it's been extensive in, in the time we've spent, uh, and we're really looking forward to, uh, to showing you the work that we've done uh, leading up to this. And um, I just appreciate everyone's effort uh, on, the, on the task force. Um, it's, it's, as we get through the presentation, I think you'll see the value and the time that everyone's invested in this, uh, and we look forward to it. Go ahead, Dr. Messler. Yeah, so I wanted to be clear, you know, our, our recommendation um, that we, the recommendation that we were asked to make, you know, we're right on the time frame that, that we committed to, you know, weeks, even months ago. Uh, we wanted to wait to hear from both the commissioner and the, and the governor, which we did. Uh, we were able to establish a, a pretty large um, safe learning task force, which um, we went into with kind of open eyes and you know, what, what's, what's the best thing for Hampstead? You know, Hampstead has never been a copycat kind of district. You know, we do, we do things what we do things that Hampstead needs done for Hampstead. So, you know, looking to other districts and trying to compare made little or no sense, even as we looked at other plans, I, you know, I have colleagues that share their plans and I share our plan with them. And, you know, we, we borrow from each other uh, or we steal from each other, uh, you call it what you may. Um, but, but taking a look at, at our facilities, we, we had some significant challenges and we'll get into that. But one point that I want to make really, really clear, right? And this is really important for everyone. I'm glad that I'm so happy that there's so many people on tonight listening because my greatest fear was, uh, you know, the people in the trenches are our paras and our teachers, you know, would somehow take responsibility for the recommendation in, in, in ways that that's happening elsewhere. You know, the NEA is taking a strong stance in, in certain states about everything should be all remote, uh, AFT as well. Um, you know, our, our, our union, we didn't really, um, our unions, if you will, chose to be part of the process. We negotiated on the front end with them. So this was more about, it wasn't about a willingness. And, and, and so this has nothing to do with, oh, the teachers wouldn't come back, so they have to do this, or the parents didn't want to come back. Absolutely not. That is 100% false. Nobody wants to be with your kids, our kids, more than our teachers and our paras in the trenches face to face. And that's really everybody's goal. And we're going to get there. We, we, we're going to get there, but there's several phases. But I think the most important thing is they chose to work collaboratively. So we didn't ask them, you know, how many of you are willing to come back and then that we didn't design a whole plan and shove it down their throats and then make them react to it. You know, what, what our unions in Hampstead, the way we go about it, it's how we negotiate contracts with them. It's how we negotiate working conditions with them. You know, we do it collaboratively. And I know that sounds, you know, that's an easy way to say things, but we really do. We, we, what we, all we wanted was them to endorse our recommendation. So it wasn't, our recommendation wasn't forced by any action or any threat of action or anything like that. It really was, you know, how do we go about the best way? And it wasn't really, you know, it's partially about reopening buildings, but it was really, let's take a look at this and see what's the safest way that we can go about our business to phase back in. So, you know, we're looking at this through phases, you know, what, how do we start? How do we get to the second phase and how do we get to our end goal is really everybody back in person um, to our new normal about how we do business. And I think we want to be very methodical. We want to be very strategic. Listen, I'm super sensitive to everyone needing to go to work and wanting their kids back in school and understanding that they need choice 
And then there's all this other stuff about, will I wear a mask? Won't I wear a mask? All that. I mean, we, we want to go about this the best way possible for Hampstead and make sure that we have a really solid plan that's safe and yet methodical in a way to get us to our desired outcome. So I just, from my takeaway from this, please, and I'm going on too long is please, please, please. This has nothing to do with the teachers or parents forcing any kind of action or forcing any kind of recommendation. We worked collaboratively to come up with the absolute safest way to kind of phase back into school. Uh, there's nothing more or less to it than that. I know other districts are hearing other things because they were surveyed on the front end and, and that forced their recommendation. That, that's not the case here. This was really a task force of 50 some odd people trying to figure out the best way to, to get back into school. So Mike, uh, if you would, if you could jump into our, um, our guiding principles and objectives and we'll, we'll go from there. Uh, so, you know, as you can imagine, putting 50 people in a room uh, trying to decide what's, uh, what's, what's the best possible plan for, for our students and staff, it can certainly be challenging. You have different views, different opinions, uh, which really made us stronger in the end. Um, and from that, we designed a few, uh, you know, guiding principles and objective. One was obviously to bring something to the board um, for, for a recommendation for how we should proceed. But some of the real, the real principles of what we did was first, obviously, a safe learning environment. Um, the well-being of everyone involved, that's custodial, that's uh, grounds, that is teachers, paras, students, that is everybody. Um, and then, obviously, we want to make sure we're, we're, we're minimal risks are occurring when, when we are going through our day um, and, and protecting everyone that's involved. Um, health and safety was in the forefront. Um, you know, we are in a global pandemic. Um, you know, everything that's going on around us is pretty, pretty visible. Um, so we want to make sure that we keep that in mind, um, along with making sure that we're enacting and we have effective safety and health protocols um, when we are returning to school. And obviously learning and teaching. Um, you know, it's, we, we decided on minim minimizing disruptions and developing continuity. And, you know, as we go through this, you're going to see the focus of those two things. I thought that was uh, very important for our group uh, to understand what we're trying to create for our community. Uh, just to give you some more background on, on what Dr. Metzler expand a little bit, uh, we, we, we then, the 50 broached into three subcommittees. So you had a, the central office subcommittee along with the central school and the middle school subcommittees. The areas of focus for those groups, uh, more at the central office level was some of the macro level things. So the calendar, transportation, food service, things like that. Uh, and then at the school level, it was clearly more about the models, delivering the instruction, uh, facility, classroom space, daily schedules, and, and safety protocols. It really allowed us to break out into our groups rather than people working on things that maybe they're not familiar with. Uh, and then after we met in our small groups, we came back as a large group to discuss. This is, um, this is, you know, this is something that we wanted to, to, to provide um, some of the public on, on, on what some of our, our guiding documents were. Now, I, I want to commend Hampstead for, for the amount of people that have sent us hundreds, hundreds, I have to say, of, of documents and articles. For every article, there was one about Germany returning to school safely. There was another one about Israel closing early. For every article, there was one about YMCA opening successfully. There was another one about an outbreak. So people just kept sending and sending information. And we really did digest everything that was coming in. At the end of the day, we had to determine some of our, our, our documents that we would continue to go back to. Um, obviously, that's the New Hampshire back to school guidance, uh, the CDC, um, the, um, excuse me, the back to school data from New Hampshire. Uh, so these are just some of the ones that we really uh, drove some of our, uh, our key decisions, not driving the decisions, but driving some of the, the research and information. Yeah, so Mike, if I could, yeah. you know, in, in other plans, um, you'll see a lot of those documents that, that, that Mr. Flynn just referred to as they're just printed out and buried in the documents, making the, you know, the, the plan a really, really long read. We tried to keep this really high level so that you could follow through pretty quickly, but those are certainly documents um, that we use to help drive decisions or help influence decisions about what we thought we could do now, what we think we can do several weeks after we open and so on and so forth. So um, those, yeah, those are documents. And if you, you need links to them, we certainly can provide them as we look at a, a more detailed, although we, this is pretty detailed, a more detailed report 
about our recommendation uh, moving forward after we get board action uh, on the one we're recommending. But um, anyway, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, so one of the things through, through all that research uh, and, and, and informational reads that we were doing is it became pretty clear that the, the safest possible guidelines to follow for our staff and students were the CDC guidelines. And, you know, there, let's just call it like it is. It's a real hot button item right now, okay? And it, at the end of the day, we wanted to make sure that we were doing everything possible. And, you know, we could go back to how we've locked our facilities or um, worked on the policies last year to make a safer spot for our students and staff. So we decided as a group that the CDC guidelines would be the, the foundation on, on some of our decision making. And, and you'll see these as we go forward, but the, the three main categories in the CDC guidelines are the lowest risk, which is obviously virtual only. More risk is what we'll call the hybrid model as we move forward. And then the highest risk would be the full return. Some of the main areas, uh, obviously, that I think are in the biggest discussion points as we move forward was uh, the CDC recommends six feet apart. That is all the way down to the arrival and dismissal. Uh, when students are walking in the building, when they're leaving the building, transitions around the building, uh, modified layouts, one-way hallways, classrooms, desks, how are they moving around the room? Um, it is recommended that at all times, students and staff are maintaining the social distance. Um, we've looked up uh, rope walks um, that, that allow the distance for some of the younger kids, um, things of that nature. Uh, mask and face shields, uh, as we move forward, we'll be discussing more, but it's more about uh, age appropriateness um, in, in the different phases. You'll see the different, um, the different rules and um, protocols that we're putting in place. Ventilation was one of the big CDC things, uh, ensuring that our systems are operating properly with increased airflow. We want to make sure that fresh air is getting in the building and the, outside, uh, the building air is going outside of the building. And then one of the other main areas of focus that we had to as a district was water systems, ensuring that our water systems were operating appropriately for uh, wash stations uh, and bathrooms and cleaning stations. Um, it was very important for us. Okay, so the reason why this slide is on there is we need to be clear as a district this is one of those those topics again that it, it's it's just it, it's a debate topic but we needed to make clear as we move forward through our phases what our district is going to be considering symptoms some people will say a headache is not a symptom it could just be the common cold which is accurate however it is also a sign of possible covid so again these are coming from the cdc guidelines and this is what we will be using moving forward when we're talking about our phases um, Hi, you, um could yeah, you go, go ahead. back one go back one slide please too yeah absolutely um, if you don't mind whoops go forward back yeah so um when we talk about our facilities right this this is one of those issues where there's a reason that we've been putting a renovation project on the ballot for so many years our facilities limit some of the things that we're able to do in a safe way with the reopening or creating a safe learning atmosphere during this pandemic and so we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in detail, but HVAC questions, you know, water not being available in certain places, being able to wash your hands, all those kinds of things, you know, each thing increased risk just a little bit for us. And so th these are some of the things we need to consider as we talk about phase two, right? So um, all these things will kind of, will need to be mitigated and we have plans and we've, you know, to, to try to work on those things. You know, phase two, a lot of people are gonna ask, what's the criteria to get to phase two? You know, we're, we're going to get a, an opportunity to see what happens elsewhere in other facilities, and we're going to get an opportunity, and it's, it's really a short turnaround. Um, we're talking early October, um, but we do have problems with our facilities that we've been trying to address for some time, and this particular situation has only complicated things as far as trying to work out what's the safest way to go about business. Thanks, Mike. I'm back. Okay. So these are the phases um, that we have, we have come to, to talk about. And this is just, you know, this is just the preface slide. So we're, we're gonna be moving forward and we're gonna be talking about the phases and what's, what's within the phases. But this is the chart that we'll keep referring to throughout the school year. Um, back to the CDC guidelines, phase one uh, is obviously the instructor model is pure virtual. Um, it's the lowest risk for spreading. 
clearly because no one's in the building. Uh, we're able to uh, maintain all that. Um, virtual learning will conduct of uh, uh, direct instruction varying by age, which we'll get into detail as we move forward here. And then transportation is a non-issue because um, we will be in, in the virtual virtual uh, excuse me virtual model. Phase two um, is is what we're going to be calling a hybrid model. Some people will be using the word blended, um, whatever it may be. It's going to be limiting the the facilities to 50% capacity, maintaining a social distance of six feet, um, mandatory masks and shields, uh, whatever is appropriate for uh, for all students and all staff. Um, and then you'll see a modified school schedule, smaller classes with online delivery through Google Classroom and Seesaw. And again, we'll talk about that. This is when transfer, go ahead Earl, yep. Yeah, the, the phase two, you know, asked recently, you know, what, what would we consider a hybrid model? And so a hybrid model would be anything more than 100% remote and less than our back to normal full return. So this is hybrid can be changed or made to be what Hampstead needs. Um, but right now we're using this criteria in phase two, but it, it could change uh, over time. So, you know, if there's a phase 2.5 before we get to phase three, we don't have that yet, but that's, you know, that's about the planning. You know, how do we go from phase one to phase two to phase three? How quickly can we do this? Um, you know, obviously there's a lot that we don't know. I, I think everyone on this call would, would, could acknowledge that, you know, what the first week of August looks like you know, the first week of October, things could look very different. They could be great or they could be, you know, we could have a complete state shutdown, we, you know, and anything in between. So uh, we're leaving that flexible, but that's really hybrid. Hybrid would be anything more than 100% virtual, but less than full, fully back to our, um, our normal. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, and this is the first phase two is also the first time that you introduce transportation into the discussion. Um, you'll see down there that uh, according to the CDC guidelines, and we have a whole slide on transportation, but you'll see that the max bus rides will be 13 to 20 students. Uh, 13 would be one student per uh, every other seat. Uh, 20 would be because siblings are allowed to sit, sit next to each other on the ride, which could increase your capacity. The, Mike, can I jump yep. in again? <laughs> yeah, no, it's and so fine. let me, I know, I know I'm rushing to some things, but this is where people's, you know, people that yep. live in Hampstead Absolutely. that have children in any one of the two Hampstead schools or at Pinkerton Academy. Uh, I'm working closely with Dr. Powers on this very issue because we're we're talking about um, their hybrid model, which is a red and white model, but transporting anywhere from 50 to 75 students daily because they're about, you know, we have about 400 students at Pinkerton from Hampstead. Uh, they don't all use the buses. So we're talking about longer runs potentially, and uh, we're working out those runs now. But what I what I made sure is whatever we designed for Pinkerton, it's not going to impact our ability to go from phase one to phase two in terms of transportation. So we have a three tiered system, meaning we use the same buses three times uh, for the, you know, obviously for the middle school and then the central school and Pinkerton, not in that order, Pinkerton, obviously then the middle school, then the central school. And so um, we need to make sure that as we design Pinkerton's transportation plan for their hybrid model, that it doesn't limit what we can do, um, you know, several weeks or so after we open. So that is being planned. Dr. Powers has been great. Um, in constant communication. And so um, that it, it, we'll, we'll be able to retrofit what we need in phase two and phase three, even with whatever Pinkerton's plans are for transportation. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. And so we move into to phase three, which would be uh, a, a full capacity of our buildings. Uh, it's the highest risk according to the CEC. It's funny, we had discussions over the color. I know it sounds crazy, but that's how, that's how deep our discussions went. Three, phase three, it, it's red because it's the highest risk. Uh, when people thought it should be a different color because it's full return. But we want to make sure that people are aware that this phase is also the most challenging. So you're talking about full student return. Um, you're talking about perhaps changing some of the rules and uh, procedures so that we can fit more students within the classroom. That's why you can see the six feet to a minimum of three feet. Uh, and then you talked about the opportunity to, to make masks um, required at times and not required at other times. And then that allows our busing to, um, to, to almost double in capacity, which would be 26 to 36 students. Mike, one more thing on phase yeah. three, uh, you know, for people to re just remember, this is a pre-vaccination phase three. A post-vaccination phase three, you know, might look different. That's, that's another reason why it's red and highest risk. Until such time we have that vaccine, I think it's, it's going to be uh, something that's going to require um, an awful lot of attention to make sure uh, that 
we mitigate all the potential problems and, and keep the risk as low as possible. So that's another reason why it was red. Okay, so our first area that we talked about uh, of the, sub uh, the subgroups or the subcommittees uh, was facilities. And as I said, we broke out uh, into the three committees. And then when we came back, we had larger discussions. Um, the subgroups uh, did an outstanding job of documenting all the discussions, all the questions, pros, cons, anything that you can think of. But in order to move forward with the recommendation, the presentation, we just wanted to bring in some common themes. Uh, we didn't need to go down the entire checklist of everything from chairs to, to tables. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we highlighted some of the big areas uh, that were brought back from the task force themselves. In regards to the facilities, uh, Central School, um, we've talked about capacity, uh, you know, my entire first year here. Um, if, if we were to head towards, um, you know, for re returning to full, uh, the number of classrooms is going to be a challenge for us with spacing. Uh, that again, you're looking at the actual classroom sizes within Central School. It's an older building. Uh, there's not as much square footage per classroom. Uh, you run into some tight spots for small learning areas or calm down areas or things of that nature. Uh, so it can certainly become challenging. The hallway size makes it really challenging to, for, for, for multiple classrooms to be transitioning at one time. Uh, you're talking about, if you're following the guidelines, you're talking about single file, different times for transition, all of those types of things. The stairwells. Uh, other than the main stairwells can become a challenge because of how small the facility is with passing up and down. Uh, and again, it's, it's not nitpicking. It was, it was talking about, all right, what if this happens? What if this occurs? What if there's two students doing this? How do we, how do we maneuver it? So these are just, again, some of the highlights. HVAC became a real topic of discussion on our groups. How's it functioning? How's our airflow? Uh, what happens when, when central school gets warm? Do the air conditioners help it at, at, at any point that were installed last year? How is the airflow within the school with some of our younger students? There is um, water on the second floor. We have one functioning bathroom on the second floor of Central School, but that would be it for washing stations available. We have no running water other than in that bathroom, no classroom sinks, uh, whereas our younger classrooms on the first floor have sinks and toilets within their classrooms. And then the bathroom kept coming back. Um, cleaning, how regularly do we clean? Um, we only have one bathroom upstairs for the, the, the amount of students. Um, it, it, it certainly just became a, a topic of discussion. And then last is furniture. It's crazy to think that some of the things that they're, they're recommending, you know, we're talking about rows and columns again. We're talking about going back 20 years with education rather than our, our carpet time and, and, and our small group areas. So. Um, Central School was obviously, I think, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone, was the largest discussion in regards to facilities. And, and then the middle school. Um, classroom size, we did, we, we did square foot measurements. And uh, with the hybrid model, um, having 50% capacity, we're talking about eight to 10 kids per classroom, um, which can certainly be a challenge. Um, and, and we're problem solving on ways to, to get kids in areas of learning. Um, same with hallway size, but that's just um, larger kids uh, moving at the same time. They're used to just having a free-for-all when they transition. Clearly, those uh, procedures would be changing. The HVAC again, uh, and furniture. You know, a lot of furniture at the middle school are tables rather than chairs, so the tables had to be six feet long. Um, so those are certainly some of the discussions. Earl, anything on that one? Well, I think, you know, another, another thing that's important here is, you know, you've, you've heard... Um, some people talk about experimenting with our kids, you know, because we're, we're trying to do something that we, we haven't done before. And um, I certainly don't want to be part of experimenting with your kids, our kids. I think one of the things as we look at our facilities, one of the things that, that Hampstead has always done, you know, they've always done the research. This right before my time, and, and certainly all my time here, uh, they, look at what, they look at what's going on elsewhere. I mean, that's why Hampstead is ne not necessarily, a, doesn't necessarily copy other districts, but certainly looks to see what happens other places. So I think the data, you know, some places are going to experiment and, and we're going to have that information in the first two or three weeks of school. It might be good information. It might help us move to phase two. It may also make us more cautious about phase two. There are other places that have bigger classrooms than we have that can put more students in a particular grade and keep them six uh, in a classroom and keep them six feet apart. Uh, we don't have that luxury, but I think, you know, being able to look at all the data um, while we 
you know, create our safe learning plan and we work from phase one to phase two. I, I really do believe that is the, the smartest, most intelligent, most strategic, most methodical way to go about um, trying to get to our end goal, which is everybody back in school in a new normal uh, in the safest way possible. So I think as we look at facilities, this is one of our, this is definitely one of Hampstead's greatest challenges because we don't have the luxury of brand new buildings with oversized classrooms with lots of um, you know, space. Uh, we have, um, you know, we've retrofitted some places in our schools and we do really well with what we have, but to um, our facilities are different than other districts, which provide different challenges for us. Um, but we will be able to see, you know, what happens in other places as we, as we talk about our, our phase one to phase two um, implementation, if you will. So thanks, Mike. Okay, um, transportation. So uh, Sandy Hoshk is, uh, you know, she is phenomenal at what she does. Um, I don't know if you've ever come across her, but the amount of time she's invested on trying to figure out how to get kids to school safely uh, is bar none. And it's, 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 it's crazy to think um, about putting students on a bus uh, coming from the normal way. And, you know, phase one, clearly there's no transportation. So you'll see some of the highlights here in phase two, um, talking about one student per seat. Uh, siblings can, can sit together, which would then make our capacity 13 to 20 students. Um, and and we, we were using the word ticketed rider um, because we got to make sure, excuse me, we have to make sure that students are sitting in the same seat uh, on the, at, at the same day and, and we're able to keep track of who's there, who's not there. Um, and then masks would be mandatory on bus rides. We also had to keep in mind that we're a three-tiered system. So when we go back to, I know Dr. Metzler mentioned that it would not impact when we're phasing in because he's been working with Pinkerton already. However, we still have to keep in mind uh, the amount of bus runs that would have to be occurring between Pinkerton, HMS, and HCS. The other thing to keep in mind is the Pinkerton buses are coming from all different communities as well. So it's not just a Hampstead community run. They'd be going out to different communities and we're using some of the same buses. Uh, there's a minimum, we did the math, minimum of two to three, some of them will require four runs. So clearly that impacts our arrival time, start of school, things of that nature. And then you have to allow time to clean in between runs. Another key point we wanted to add in there, as Sandy brought to our attention, is that because of uh, it being a driving hazard, that bus drivers uh, will not be wearing masks while driving the bus. Um, you know, they use several instances where it could have popped up and, and block vision, however it may be. Um, so while the bus is motion, in motion, uh, bus drivers would not be wearing masks. Clearly, they were looking for other alternatives, um, but we just wanted to make sure that that was a, a point of emphasis when we we're discussing um, transportation. Phase three is when we would be attempting to return all of our students to school, um, but it, it, it would not be safe to put another 50 45, 50, 60 kids on a bus. So we maintained as a group that two students, upping into two students per seat, uh, allowing 26 to 36 per bus, same thing, ticketed way so we could keep track. Uh, masks, again, still mandatory because of the bus. Clearly in the, that was not me. Clearly in the fall and or the spring, uh, you know, windows would be open, things of that nature. But as the, uh, the colder months moved along, um, you, you have to be aware of the ventilation same thing, three tiers, but you can see that our, our, our runs would decrease from one to two, possibly three, depending on the runs, uh, and the same rules would apply for masks. Okay. Um, food service. So food service is, uh, we have a great partner and, and, and we have, I'm, I'm going to go through. So just, I don't know who's aware or who's not. So that's where this is going. So uh, at the, and, and during when we went into, um, excuse me, when school was shut down, uh, the USDA waived um, their, it's going to sound crazy. They waived their waiver. So anyone was, um, was uh, able to participate in the, the free and reduced lunch program, pick up meals. Now our food pantry is, phenomenal and they're the ones that picked up uh, the Hampstead community when we were going through that challenging time. Coming into this year, the, the USDA is no longer uh, allowing the waiver. Not everyone qualifies, so it's going back to the same rules that it was prior to um, the, the original outbreak. So 
the, the only people that will qualify for the free and reduced lunch, lunches are the ones that um, apply and fill out uh, the waiver. Um, so we're going to have to, um, we're going to be working with the food service team to, to figure out the numbers. Uh, and then we're anticipating, obviously, that there'll be an increased number of applicants for free and reduced lunch. In discussion with the team, we wanted to make sure that it was more of a model coming out of our school. So we have a plan in place, uh, whether we are hybrid, excuse me, if, whether we are full remote hybrid for an opportunity for students and families to be a part of the lunch program. And there'll be a, a common location when we are hybrid, uh, which would be the middle school, and they'll be able to pick up, uh, we're gonna have a sign up plan, same type of thing. And it says the USDA allows for three days at a time. That's not necessarily the model that we'll be using, uh, but I just wanted people to be aware that, you know, we could pick up on Monday and you'd have food for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You pick up on Wednesday, then you'd have food for Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, the food pantry partnership is in there for, as a supplemental. We wanna to continue to, to use our local resources as needed um, and make sure that everyone is, is taken care of uh, however we need. So Mike, if I could? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, you know, first, um, you know, obviously, you know, the church, the food pantry, you know, Isaiah 58, you know, Hampstead has a, a, a great support network um, to help people in need. Uh, I'd like to believe that our school district also, you know, did that last spring in terms of, you know, crisis response to this pandemic. You know, and Chris Farrow at, uh, at, at Fresh Picks was just um, outstanding. So we want to embrace this model, but we want to find ways to um, enhance our relationship with those other providers. Uh, so we're looking at creative ways. You know, some people thought, well, why can't you just donate all the food? And, you know, there are all kinds of regulations with USDA and there's certain things we can and can't do. And I don't, I don't want to get, you know, too far uh, down the road on that in this discussion. But I think we certainly can increase our, our, our partnership with those people that are helping the people most in need. And so um, Fresh Picks has been outstanding. I think we have a, a really good, um, you know, model here that will be able to support people that are looking for food, our, our guidance counselors, and certainly other staff members will be reaching out to families in need. And, um, I, you know, I really feel that we have wraparound services to help people. Now, this isn't just about food. It'll be about internet connection. It'll be, you know, whether it's Wi-Fi, it'll be about devices. It really is, you know, wraparound in terms of whatever families need to be successful. Now, I know people will say, I need daycare or I need, you know, and so there are other things that we're really going to have to look at. Um, what we can and can't provide, or certainly what resources. But there are obviously other service providers in town that um, we certainly can partnership to try to help families. Um, we certainly want everybody back to work. We want everybody back to school. We want to certainly try to help our families. But again, we're going to focus on safety. And um, I, I really appreciate what Fresh Picks is doing for us here in terms of being, you know, a really safe way to provide um, food service to the families that need it most. Thanks, Mike. Okay, technology. All right, so um, we're going to speak a little bit where we were in the spring further on the presentation. So to bring it back here, um, clearly uh, through the discussions of, of the task force and, 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 the, and the parents that have contacted us, um, you know, supplying a device for our students, I think is imperative, whether we're fully remote or hybrid. And if you want to really know the truth, they're, they're definitely a resource within the classroom if we're in full return anyways. So um, the goal would be uh, to provide a, a, a device, a Chromebook for students in grades one through eight. Uh, we would need, uh, the tech team did an inventory. We would need about 200 more to make that happen. Um, and then pre-K and K uh, would be iPads as determined by uh, the families in, in Central School. Um, to shift from that, uh, another thing that, that we've, we've all reflected on as a group here in Hampstead um, and certainly another one from the parents, as we'll discuss in a little bit, is, is consistent technology. And, and what is consistent technology? It means every time that, uh, whether you're in hybrid or fully remote, whatever it may be, uh, it shouldn't be a scavenger hunt every time a parent needs to help a student locate something. Uh, so we're gonna really drive our, our instruction through consistent technology. Um, teachers are gonna be on the same page. So what you're getting in one second grade class, you'll be able to get a second, another second grade class. Uh, we're gonna really start to streamline and, and narrow down our resources. But that also leads to technology and the help that is needed. Now my team in the tech office, I think we can all agree did a, a phenomenal job in helping the district through, through the spring. But we also have to be more realistic on, on how thin they were straight. So 
we might need some additional support with the technology team uh, for helping with uh, broken Chromebooks, um, connections, uh, basically, it, it, believe it or not, it's just a helpline type of stuff. Um, and then through our discussions, um, and actually my own personal uh, uh, use in my town with, with my students who are in, in grades three and, and five, uh, we, we use Clever. So it's a single sign-on uh, platform. So if we need to do Lexia or whether it is uh, Reflex Math, um, from our webpage, you'd go, uh, the students would be able to log on and all of their resources would be right there. They would click and it would automatically log them in. So parents aren't emailing asking what's the password here, what's the password there. Uh, it would really help uh, streamline some of our technology. Mike, before you move on? Yeah. You can go back? Yeah, I got <laughs> it. So technology, you know, obviously, um, you know, we all have, every district has some great people behind the scenes and we, we have Joe Dion who, uh, has um, made sure and so this is one of those things we'll talk about more about you know how is our our whether it's fully remote or hybrid models how are they going to look different when we're providing you know a virtual learning experience um, he's assured me that our, our bandwidth and I'm, I'm not a i'm not a tech guy so but i do know that sometimes when you try to live stream out everything from one place from every room you know if you don't have the proper bandwidth um, he's assured me that uh, we're working on that and we're going to have the we'll have the capacity uh, to live stream from every single classroom for those teachers that are actually in using their their materials to to meet real time real live instruction uh, with our kids. So um, you know I thank Joe for that work. It, it, it seems like simple work, but it's it's complicated when you're trying to make sure that you can live stream from every single classroom in, in two buildings. So uh, that's going to be a big upgrade or or something in, that's going to assist us um, with whatever models we use. And and certainly you know when this pandemic you know finally we we finally defeat it um, and we're we're still talking about blizzard bags or, or any kind of virtual learning that we need to do on a day where we can't be in the buildings um, we're going to be a, a lot better at it with better technology and a better capacity to um, to live stream so um, again that's going to be a, a a great technology enhancement so thanks joe thanks mike yeah and that's also a compliment to the board you know last year we, we came and we proposed a, a massive infrastructure upgrade to our wireless system uh, and you all supported it. And it's going to show that was, you know, we supported that prior to the pandemic. So that'll definitely reap uh, the root the rewards of, of the upgrade. Yeah. So just circle that back around, Mike, you know, when we talk about the board, um, we, we talk about the strategic plan. We talk about how they budget and how they goal set. And so as we put this plan together, safety is a big part of our, our strategic plan. Technology is a big part of our, our, our plan as well as equity. You know, getting the services to the people that need the most. So, um, again, yeah, the, you know, working for a board that you know has that kind of vision um, is powerful, and I think that has been helpful in this process of putting together this plan. Okay, we're going to get into a little bit of the nitty gritty here of each each of the phases. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna discuss some of the things that uh, that we we worked on as a task force. I want to bring it real back, real bring it back real quick to to where we started. Um, you know, we're, we started in March, on March 13th, our entire industry got flipped upside down in the educational system. So on March 13th, we left on a Friday, and then we, we were told we had essentially three days to prepare uh, for, for remote learning is what it was called. Um, you know, I would call that more of an emergency response rather than virtual learning. Um, I think we went from a profession uh, where people didn't know even what Zoom was to having to try and figure it out. We went from never posting on Google Classroom in the younger grades to having to have them log in, to not knowing their email addresses. All of those things as a profession, we tried to piece together from March until June. I think everyone in, in our district, um, specifically the professional staff, would say that I think they gave you 120%. They tried their best. They tried to figure it out. They did what was ever possible. I think every one of them would also say that it wasn't their best. And not their best because they weren't trying is because there was so much going on, not only just in their world, with their own families, all of those things that were affecting everyone at that time. So for them to say that they gave their best uh, quality instruction, I don't think that's, I don't think that's um, um, fair to anyone. I know that they were, they were certainly doing what they were uh, capable of. Um, so that's why you're going to see uh, some of the things that we discussed as, as a team here on the task force on how and, and, and ways that we're gonna definitely improve, uh, but also deliver. Um, it's, it's important that um, we don't want parents teaching kids. 
you know, as I said, I was teaching a second grader and a fourth grader last year. My head was spinning in some of the stuff that I was teaching. So we want to make sure that we're going to be delivering instruction appropriately. So in the new, uh, you know, 2020 experience, you know, some people were saying remote learning 2.0, um, things of that nature. You know, it was important for us to, to get away from that remote learning uh, wordage uh, because we want it to be different. And so we really focused on making it a virtual learning experience. Within that, you're going to see far more organizational structure and technology structure. As I discussed previously on, on, the, on the technology slide, you're going to see far more, um, uh, I'll say, of a, a schedule as you'll see here as we move forward. Uh, but it's going to be, all right, who do I contact? What do I do? Uh, we're not flying by the seat of our pants. We'll have procedures and protocols in place uh, for all things in regards to virtual learning. You're going to see consolidated systems and applications as I spoke to before. So uh, you're not going to be searching through 15 applications to figure out what am I supposed to be doing for the assignment. We're not going to send you on internet scavenger hunts on where I should be and what time. Um, you're going to see uh, far more consolidated systems and applications that, are, that our teachers have already been starting to figure out since, since uh, the summer began. You're going to see structured schedules for students and staff. Um, you will not see the model of get the assignments on Monday and you complete on time. You're going to see uh, structured time for students and, and staff to be together, small groups, large groups, counseling, um, all those types of things during virtual uh, learning. You'll see direct instruction via Zoom or Google Meet. Uh, and we put age appropriate, as you'll see on the next couple slides, uh, what you can expect out of a, as kindergartner, you can't expect out of a first, second grade or what an eighth grader is not going to be the same as, uh, you know, a fifth or a fourth grader. You're going to see increased rigor and accountability. Um, you know, I think I'll commend our staff again for doing personalized report cards uh, for the central school at the end of that school year uh, to really make it uh, valuable at that time. But you're going to see uh, certainly uh, regular assessments, um, more um, performance assessments, uh, performance tasks uh, that are going to be important to not only just our, our staff, uh, but also our students. You'll see data monitoring, increased progress monitoring. Uh, and then one of the, you know, again, the task force, uh, one of the things that came out of is we really need to figure out, not figure out, or, or what we what we designed is a better way to communicate with parents on a regular basis. Um, you know, checkpoints, uh, weekly check-ins, team check-ins, depending on the grade level. We want to make sure that the parents understand what we're doing, what their children are doing, and making sure, uh, as we said, that, that people aren't getting lost. So, Mike, um, yeah. you know, a couple of things. First, you know, the, the crisis learning, you know, when we, we um, I, I would hope everyone can, you know, we can reflect and, and be appreciative of the fact that our staff, you know, did the best they could under the circumstances that were out of their control. And that was their best under those circumstances, but they all took the opportunity to reflect. And we made a commitment to whatever our virtual learning would be moving forward would be better. And I, I made that comment at our last board meeting, it will be better. You know, it will be different. It will be redesigned. And I, and I appreciate you, you talking a little bit about that. I think, you know, we're also talking about um, some of our students that are going to need um, modifications, you know, students that need uh, services in, in delivered in a different way. And we'll, we'll address those special services um, in the spirit of equity, you know, as we, as we bring people back in person, um, we're gonna get those services to the people that need them most. And that, that's the spirit of equity. But I think um, our communication and our structure, those are two things that are really, really important to families, making sure that whatever we design is structured, something they can depend on, you know, try to make the day a normal school day. So uh, that's part of our work. And so you, the next slide, if you would go to the next slide, Mike, um, and I'll, I'll let you jump back in as soon as I, I finish this, but you know, you see the side, it says to be negotiated. Well, you know, Hampstead has a history of, you know, which is great in terms of climate and culture, you know, the, our building level principals and teachers in Paris are very much involved in, in what the, the schedule is and how they deliver the services in the best way possible. This is not a top down model. Um, we give them some structure or some guidelines to kind of work within and we work with them to help them come up with the best plan. But each school may, may look a little bit different. Each class, each team of teachers may do things just a little bit different uh, with the same um, outcome uh, or goal in mind of, of making sure that we do the best of delivering instruction and services in a structured, organized way and communicate really, really well with families. So I didn't know if you were going to, um, if we wanted to bring uh, Dillard in, uh, you know, Principal Collins into this part of the discussion, uh, if that was the plan, Mike, you know. We actually, 
Yeah, so we decided I'm going to go forward with it, and then they'll jump in if I mess it up. <laughs> right. Excellent, excellent. Well, okay. you know, Principal, Principal Collins, nobody knows the Central School better than Principal Collins and certainly uh, his schedule. So that's yes. a tremendous vote of confidence that, um, that he's endorsed you, your presentation. So I'm ahead. sure he's listening very closely. Uh, he is going to jump in on, on um, when we get to a, a certain section here. But it's, it's important to note that, um, you know, everyone's, everyone's, I don't know how to say it. Everyone wants to know, obviously, what a day will look like. And we've done our best to draft uh, what that will be. I just want to be clear that these are samples. So, you know, whatever you're seeing might change. I, I just want to be really transparent. It really depends on um, the development with, as, as Earl said, with, with the people that are, that are doing the work. So what we did oh, my, is, it, my, go ahead. Yeah, so, you know, so as I'm a, a parent listening, okay, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how do I plan and what's this going to look like. It won't look vastly different. Our plan really is, and I want you to think, you know, obviously begin with the end in mind. So the end is within the next couple of weeks is to make sure all the details, all those questions that you have right now about what your particular child's gonna look like, that will all be done in subcommittees over the next two weeks. Um, so we're hoping by the 18th of August, everybody knows exactly what their schedules look like and, and, and what their jobs will look like, you know, from a person delivering the service to people receiving the services to families that are supporting the services. And then that gives us a solid, you know, you know, almost four weeks. If we talk about a soft opening the week of the 14th of September, on the week after Labor Day with all the professional development um, front loaded, you know, it gives us an opportunity to really um, make sure that everything is communicated as clearly and everybody knows what their expectations are. So I think, yeah, it won't look vastly different from this, but each, each building will, will, will really personalize it for each team and, and the teachers and paras will be very much involved in, in, because these are working conditions. So, you know, it's, it's contractual. We, we have to do it, but it's the right way to do it right? Because this has a, a major impact on, on our, our members in our HEA and HASS on their, on their day and, and their ability to deliver services uh, and instruction to, to our students. So thanks, Mike. Go ahead. Yeah. So this is, um, this is, this is a, you know, a matrix of, of what you can, you can anticipate. Uh, I'm going to show you a sample schedule next slide, which will probably be for you visual people like me, will be much more uh, digestible than something like this. Uh, but we wanted to, to take into account what, what students would be receiving, you know, reading math. They, we want to get them back with morning meetings, uh, get into some type of structure and routine. Uh, like we said, developing continuity and, and minimizing disruptions. Um, so you'll see something along these lines. We, we, we kind of broke it into this, but I think this um, this next slide will, will be far more visual for people. So this, this is a grade one sample virtual schedule. Um, you know, we, we, we decided on a nine o'clock time, um, keeping it, trying to keep both buildings at the same time in regards to, to those things. You know, again, those may shift, may not. We just wanted to give something visual to see. You'll see a morning meeting with your classroom teachers and classmates, uh, which will roughly 20 minutes. Uh, and then you get into some of your schoolwork. So you'll get into your language arts lessons, and, and the biggest question probably coming out of this type of slide is why is there a gap from 9.45 to till 10.30 if there's only 20 minutes? And that is to allow students to complete the work. And then when they come back at 10.30, that'd be the opportunity obviously for them to ask questions uh, or work something through. So again, these are rough estimates of times. Wanted to give you an idea of what students would be doing, language arts, math. Uh, and you know, Dr. Messler has mentioned it several times for, for those of you that may not have tuned into the me in a minute with the eighth grade. Uh, but it was very clear with our eighth grade students that unified arts um, was important to them. And, and so many people had reflect, so many students have reflected on the arts at their time in the Hampstead School District. So we wanted to make sure that unified arts were, were becoming more of a focus um, in, in, in virtual learning. Um, obviously, they mentioned about between sessions, time for students to complete work, come back, ask questions. Uh, and then the afternoon, not that school ends at 1130. Um, but the direct instruction and, and classroom meetings would, because that would allow for opportunity in the afternoon to then do intervention, remediation, small group support, counseling sessions, things of that nature. It allows for uh, the work, the majority of the work to be done in the morning, uh, and then allow for the flexibility of the staff and the students in the afternoon. So the middle school, uh, with my middle school brain and, and experience, it's gonna be obviously a little bit more direct because you have older students and, and, and the schedule is far different. So it's a little bit more straightforward. So you, they can handle the capacity to be, be a little bit larger with the students and the time. Um, 
we really want to uh, stress the advisory program and get that back in. Um, that was a, a big success for us uh, uh, last year at the middle school. Um, and then you get into core academics. Now, you know, that could be math one day, language arts the next day. Um, you're really in the virtual world, you're going to have a block mindset at the middle school. Um, you know, what you math on Monday, uh, you'll be um, the, the following day, you'll have your, your other core, uh, and then you revisit math uh, the following day. So it's really a block mindset when you start going to the middle school and we start talking about these next two models, uh, but it allows for everyone to have uh, direct instruction in, in appropriate time. So Mike, is it, is it fair to say that Principal Danola gave you the same endorsement? It was okay for you to present uh, her schedule, right? So. Yeah. Yes, it was. Thank you, Mr. Nolan. I appreciate and the I, support. And let's, let's just say, say it one more time. You know, I, I think once the, you know, the task force, you know, every single member of HAS or HEA that wanted to be on it and, and, and having 50 something people on the task force was, 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 was larger than we perhaps um, expected. But our hope is as we, when we break back into the subcommittees that the, the actual task force is going to grow because I think, um, Classroom teachers and paras in both buildings, I think, are going to jump in uh, and, and assist with the creation of this schedule. So I think um, that's, where, that's where you could see it change a little bit. And you're right, the times are rough times. But I think uh, at the end of the day, making sure that um, we, we meet all the aspects, you know, the whole child in terms of, you know, uh, their social, emotional well-being. Is that being addressed? Are they having an opportunity? Um, you know, we offer two unified arts or, uh, for a reason. Are they going to have opportunity to have direct instruction from their unified arts teachers? Yes. You know, are they getting all those, you know, those, um, those core uh, subjects um, with direct instruction? That's a yes. So when we talked about this looking and feeling very different, it will look and feel very different than the crisis planning from last spring. Um, you know, we also have to talk about what transitions look like. You know, how are ways that we open the day? How are... Um, you know, how are we opening school? There's a lot of those things that we're going to take a good look at and how do we, how do we go about making it special and making it something that, um, you know, feels like, all right, this is a new normal, but th this is good for now and it's safe and, and uh, it works for me and my family. You know, we don't want families to feel the burden that they have to do the teaching, um, but we are relying on the families for support. And so, you know, as parents, and I'm a parent, just like everyone else on this call, you know, being able to provide that kind of support to your children and being involved in their, their learning is, is really um, special moments. And they go, they come and go fast. Um, although the spring felt like an eternity, I'm sure for everyone self included. So um, again, we want, we want you in a support role. We don't want you to feel like you're the, the direct, the teacher role. And especially for our students that need special modifications, um, you know, as part of their individual education plans and those sorts of things we need to really uh, take a hard look at that and make sure in the spirit of equity that if there are ways we're, we're going to, we are absolutely going to have to have those students um, in person, in small groups, somehow, some way um, in every phase. So um, that has to happen. And I think we're committed to that. And um, I thank the parents for their patience. Uh, and I feel your frustration. I know the spring was very hard, especially for students with disabilities and uh, we, we are committed to making sure that we use the resources that we have to help families with that kind of support um, in the spirit of equity. You know, the people that need the services most are getting them first. So, um, okay, Mike, thanks. You got it. Okay, so getting into phase two. Um, so just to remind everyone, that would be the hybrid. So that's when we would be lowering the population, or excuse me, welcoming back 50% uh, at a time um, to keep social distancing in place. Uh, to make sure that we're protecting everyone, um, but also beginning that instruction, live instruction, uh, which is we all know, as Earl said, is so important, and it's uh, definitely where we all want to be. Um, so in class, uh, you'll see the common teacher, student learning. Um, what I say and have been saying to, to all the staff is we could open up the school tomorrow. Uh, that's what we're good at, right? So that's what we signed up for. Uh, that's why we went to school um, it's, it's really, uh, we could open up tomorrow and teach a hundred kids if we need to. Um, so that's what you'll see. You'll see the common, uh, teacher, student learning. Uh, but on the other side, you're going to see a little bit of a shift here in, in, in instead of the virtual learning, it's going to be remote instruction. So it's going to be, it's going to be asynchronous learning. So again, you're, you're, you're thinking about that model of, all right, what happened in class? It's a continuation from that class. Uh, there'll be things that are put in place for the students to learn on their off day, off day, excuse me, their remote day. Um, but it's going to make sure that it's connecting with what's currently going on in the class. Um, 
you'll see continuity in, in the curriculum. Uh, you'll see um, that being able to be back and forth in, in that open line of communication, uh, specifically through Google Classroom and Seesaw. Um, it's, it's important that even though uh, we'll be welcoming uh, people back into the building, uh, especially the students, it's important to understand that we need to maintain uh, on that off day, it's not a day off from school, right? We don't wanna go back to that model where, all right, I'm not in school this day, I don't need to do anything. Uh, it's the opposite. That, that remote day is gonna be a supplemental to, to the, the in-person instruction and what's going on. Okay, so getting into our hybrid, um, we are gonna go with blue and gold. Uh, it was a tough negotiation with central school and middle school. Um, that's why you see the white day in the middle on Wednesday. Um, everyone's colors are represented, uh, but this gives you more of a visual. As I said, I'm, I'm a visual person. It allows you to understand uh, what the week would look like uh, in the hybrid model. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things that are out there. We chose alphabetical, and as Mr. Collins uh, pointed out to me very clearly in all of his years, in central school that he thinks uh, that it would be probably more representative going A to H um, rather than A to L. But the goal more specifically is to cut our population in half, but also make sure that families, students were on the same day rather than doing different grade levels. So if we were to send five and seven one day and six and eight another, but you have a fifth and an eighth grader, that's not gonna work out for your family and your household. So uh, it's not gonna be specifically A through L or M through Z. Again, these are all tentative. Uh, but the goal was to make sure that we were able to keep families on the same schedule. Uh, so on Monday, you'd see in uh, if you're A to L in person, then a remote day. We'll talk about a flex day in a second, and then you come back again in person, and then you're remote. Uh, that flex day is, is, is going to be multiple things that occur on that day. Uh, small group services, um, teacher planning, because um, it's they, they will be doing uh, multiple planning. So now you're not only just planning for your in-classroom day, but you gotta make sure you're supporting your students on the day that they are, that they are home remote. So we wanted to allow that opportunity for, for, for staff and for, for students to wrap their brain around. And as, as Dr. Metzler mentioned before, you know, I think he said phase 2.3 or whatever it may be, but that flex day may, may go as we move forward to that phase three. Uh, we just want to make sure that when, we, when we're transitioning from fully remote to hybrid, that we're allowing that opportunity for everyone to wrap their brain around about another transition, not only in the student's life, but the family's lives. All right, so these schedules become a little bit more straightforward um, rather than the, the virtual learning. Uh, you'll see the in-person learning. Uh, the caveat there is this is the, remember this is the first time we're introducing transportation so uh, we have 9, 9 a.m arrival uh, but that may be staggered it may be delayed however it may be in order to accommodate our, our students that are taking uh, transportation to school and then you'll see a little bit more of that regular schedule so your morning meeting for our k and first graders you'll see flesh language arts lunch initial discussions are that they will occur in the classroom um, you know, not to go down too much of the weeds in that discussion, but that was the safest way for our students to eat lunch when we're returning to school for the first time. Then you talk about recess, math, UAs, recess, and then dismissal. Um, on, that, on that day, the gold day, whatever, excuse me, whatever student you are, uh, that would be a continuation of learning from, from in-person. Students can will be accessing both Seesaw and Google Classroom, but there's also gonna be materials uh, that they, they're taking home from school, whatever's assigned to them. Uh, so you get to see a little bit more of a give and take. So Mike, I think it's important that as, as people are listening to this presentation, um, and, and I think a lot of times, you know, we're, we're hoping for choice, right? We want to be able to, you know, and I think as we transition, choice will be more and more, will be available, right? Because some people, phase two may, not, may be too much for some folks, phase three may be completely off the table for some folks. And we're, we're going to need, that's why we need to, really be able to tweak things um, to meet the needs of the community as we get to those phases, because we're not quite sure, you know, people may feel a certain way today on August 4th, but feel very differently by October 20th about, you know, what they may or may not be willing to do. Uh, and that's true on both sides of this, what families may or may not be willing to do and what staff may or may not be, be willing to do um, based on the science and the data at that time. You know, one of the things I think that 
that people have asked is, you know, what's the criteria, you know, and, and we're not committing to a specific criteria other than what we're committing to is we, we are committed to getting everybody back full time as soon as we possibly can with a phased approach. That's what we're committing to. So, you know, what is the, what, you know, what are the stats? If, if it's three people that are sick, if it's five people that are sick, you know, that's not really where we are. We really want to be able to, as a community, see, all right, where are we now and what are we willing to do and you know what are we able to do and i think that that's probably more important than committing to any particular stat um, but i want everyone to be comfortable with the fact that we are committed to getting to phase two as quickly as we can and hopefully getting everybody back as quickly as we can but we're not going to do it in a way that's not safe right so that's really what we're trying to do a very strategic methodical approach and i hope people see choice um coming Right. I mean, I know you're saying like, well, day one, I don't have choice and you know, everybody's, everybody's remote. But at some point, um, I believe, you know, people will feel that they ha do have choice uh, and uh, that will be great. So uh, we're working on it. Thanks, Mike. OK, in the middle school, you'll get to see a little bit more of a full schedule in the hybrid model. Um, so we'll be able to uh, move throughout our team schedules as, as normal. If you have a middle school student, you know what I'm speaking to. Uh, you get to see all four cores. Uh, you get to see your, both UAs. Uh, excuse me, five cores. Uh, some some grade levels, um, and you and you'll see a far more. I'll call it a normal schedule within the middle school. Same thing. You're going to see a little bit more of a block mindset when you're in the hybrid model for middle school. So, um, depending on what you see in, in, with your teachers on Monday, uh, then you'll continue that work on Tuesday, and then you'll revisit the next time you see your teacher. Okay, so phase three is, uh, is full return. So students and staff return with normal instruction. Uh, but as we mentioned in that chart, we have precautions in place, still trying to maintain uh, three to six feet social distance, uh, mass required at certain times, um, uh, making sure that, that we're still doing and protecting every, everyone possible during the school day. And uh, showing you probably most things that you already know, but for those uh, new, new families might be in town or, or incoming students, um, we're gonna have your, your typical morning day, which you kind of saw on the hybrid, um, but obviously um, it, it'll be with all of the students at one time. And then moving forward, uh, same thing with, with your full return to middle school. So um, not, not anything you haven't seen if you've had students here, but we wanted to make sure if, if you're new to the district uh, or have new uh, students coming up, uh, at what it might possibly be. Okay, so these are the slides that I cannot, Mr. Collins did not feel comfortable with me talking about. So I'm gonna let him jump in and continue on the next two slides. Actually, Mr. Flynn, you're doing a wonderful job. Thank you very much. <laughs> you have my full endorsement. Uh, so you can take over the kindergarten thing here, but I think you kind of wanted me to be the one here to sort of deliver some of this. In the phase one, uh, the specific conversation we've been having about preschool, uh, based upon what happened this past spring, uh, we just want to let everyone know that we did not collect tuition during the remote learning phase at the end of the year. In fact, we ended up uh, refunding some parents that had paid up front and we just sent checks back. So parents basically paid for two thirds of a school year last year. So following in that same spirit, uh, we are not going to charge tuition during the virtual learning. As a matter of fact, we're just going to give all of our kindergarten students the same basic support that they've, um, we were this new robust learning that we plan on providing during the virtual time, which means our, our four kindergarten teachers will work together and other teachers will continue to offer the support that is necessary for them. We do want to get into the phase two of hybrid learning as soon as possible. As a matter of fact, it's been our recommendation that the first students that return whenever we can roll into the hybrid learning be the younger students because we feel that that need is very important. Um, we will then move the students into their full day or half day setting, which means if they're a full day kindergarten student, they'll attend two full days. If they're a half day kindergarten student, uh, then those children would attend the morning or the afternoon on the two days that are ultimately assigned to them. Uh, we will 
at that point in time start thinking of tuition for full day students, but it's gonna be a significantly reduced tuition rate. Uh, we've been talking to the business office about exactly what that means, but we're gonna use the concept of a prorated tuition. And when, of course, when we do return to the full, um, the full program, at that point in time, we will have all the students attend, you know, whatever the intention was, or you know, as close as we can to typical. And at that spot, then uh, the whole concept of tuition will move forward, and it's again prorated. It all depends when that happens. Uh, we have a little bit of history having done it last year with some success. Thank you. We can move on to the next slide. You can see uh, some of the similar conversation about preschool. We do not feel that we can provide a, uh, a strong virtual learning environment for some of our preschool students. So therefore, in the first phase with virtual learning, we are not going to attempt to provide a virtual learning program for our youngest, meaning the three and four year olds. We will certainly provide materials to all of the families. Um, and we will certainly provide some of the flipped classroom pieces, but we're not going to try to put little three and four year olds in front of a screen to try to do that. Um, I have a five year old granddaughter. She can barely sit still with that. Um, but she will certainly absorb the time when she's ready. And that's what we're, we're hoping to provide. When we move to the phase two, we're going to put all of our students and I just like a little bit of background knowledge here. Our preschool program has a three-day program, a four-day program, and a five-day program. And some are three-year-olds, some are four-year-olds, some of them are mixed up. What we would do in the hybrid learning phase, we would want to start, uh, start the students into a two-half-day thing. All of our children are already in half-day, so they would attend two days. And uh, there are a few students that pay tuition to come to our preschool program. Uh, there are many students that attend our preschool program. It is part of our special education early outreach. Uh, so therefore, we do not charge tuition for some of those, for those students. And uh, we would then take care of these students as far as uh, what we typically refer to as the typical students that are tuitioning into our preschool. It'll be a very small tuition. Um, we certainly want to encourage the families that have enrolled them to stay with us. Um, and then phase three, and that's when we just go full flight and then we'll start working on the full tuition piece. And uh, the tuition amounts are really going to be um, developed around whenever we make the transition. So it's gonna be a lot of bookkeeping to keep track of all those numbers. We've got a new secretary in the office that took over for the legendary Nancy Lacasse. Um, she used to work for an accounting firm, so she's ready for the challenge. Um, so thank you very much. And once again, uh, Mr. Flynn, you've done a wonderful <clears throat> job covering Central School and Middle School. And uh, Dr. Messler, thank you for your kind words. Okay. Dr. Messler, you want to take this one or me? I yeah, sure. Um, okay. Yeah, so, so special education. So, you know, this is, um, you know, I talked a little bit about this, you know, just several minutes ago. And, and you know, I'm working with Francine. Flynn and actually working with HEA and Haas. What, what, what we're currently doing, and I'll go through the slide um, pretty quickly, but what we're currently doing is we're, um, we're assessing capacity, right? We're finding out what, we're, what we can do uh, with the staff that we have. And so what does that mean? Well, you know, special education, it's all individual education plans and the services are, are tailored to meet the needs of particular individuals. So what we've charged our, our director with is really you know, take a look at your team, find out what your capacity is, you know, who's willing to do what, you know, how, how can we have kids in, who may go to homes, uh, do home visits, you know, how do we get the testing done, all those sorts of things. Uh, and again, in the spirit of equity, right, you know, we're committing that these are our students that need the services the most, um, you know, as soon as possible and, and went through a really difficult spring. So we're, we're committed to this and, and she's working on that. Now, that may mean um, there might be some things we may have to contract out. Uh, we may need to bring in. We're not quite sure yet because she's still in the process. And, uh, and then our staff will be reaching out to families and really working on this, you know, because each one of those contracts, if you will, those IEPs, those are contracts with a family about how we're going to deliver services. Um, and we're going we're gonna to make sure that uh, each family has an opportunity to make sure that those services are being delivered in the best way possible. So, um, we're committed to that. So if you look at the delivery of the IEP services, we'll consider individual educational needs and the safety of students and staff. That's the, the willingness, you know, who's willing to go to homes and, you know, what are the testing protocols and, and all those sorts of things. We're going to flush all that out. The administration, special education teachers, paraeducators, and related service providers are committed to working together 
with families to support students remotely and or in person safely. So again, this will be choices again. How do we get, you know, how do we get the services to you as we move from phase one to phase two to phase three? Again, we are committed. Um, the dates are somewhat arbitrary. You know, we have checkpoints. We want to take a look um, to try to get to phase two as quickly as possible. And then obviously the ultimate goal is to get everybody back. And in the meantime, these contracts that we have with families to make sure that you get the services you need. Um, that's our director, Francine Flynn. She's going to be working closely with, with her staff uh, to get that done. And, and then finally, per the New Hampshire governor's executive order, our IEP teams will convene within the first 30 days of school to determine whether any uh, compensatory education is required due to the school closure during the pandemic. And we're certainly going to provide that. So, you know, we have testing we need to do. We have plans, the contracts that we need to look at. Uh, we need we need to figure out what our capacity is to deliver, and we need to work really, really closely with our families. This was extremely challenging in in March and April, where you know the willingness you know of, of being able to to make sure staff is safe. You know, at times, you know, having students you know going to students' homes or or having students in um, some of those options we did not have. I, th I think we have a we have a lot more flexibility now uh, in phase one into phase two. And so um, we're going to make sure that, um, that we stay committed to this. So um, that's our, our special education uh, commitment to you. I hopefully, um, you know, families, you will be hearing shortly from, from our special ed team and counselors to, to make sure that those services are being provided in the way that works best for you and your, and your children. Thanks, Mike. In, in one of our biggest roadblocks, you know, talk about reflecting is we have to remember that we were in a stay-at-home order. Uh, so that really handicapped a lot of the things that Dr. Metzler just said, you know, uh, soliciting the work out, home visits, uh, whatever it may be for, for those services. Um, but, so, but that being said, Mike, I yeah. mean, I, I do need, we do need to commend, you know, it, it wasn't perfect, yeah. um, sure. but there were, there were times where people were at individuals' homes trying to deliver services, whether they were our employees or contracted employees. Now, you know, that was, that was difficult. We couldn't do that for every IEP, every contract. And, and you're right, that stay at home piece, but you know, with additional flexibility here uh, for staff and families, I think uh, we just need to make sure, and this is a really personalized kind of approach to making sure that you get the services, making sure that our, our staff is, is having those conversations directly with the parents to providing the support and making sure that the students get exactly what they need. So, so thanks for that, Mike. All right. I think this one's yours too. This is, I mean, so this is, I mean, a very simple slide with, you know, with four circles and, and, and this is really um, our entire plan. It's, it's fluid. It, it will change. We're not, you know, the dates are somewhat arbitrary. I mean, everybody was concerned that if we start remote, we'll be in remote forever. So, you know, we're planning, you know, and then we're executing the do piece. Uh, we need to evaluate and then we need to adjust. And, and it's really a cycle that we, we're really going to need to stay committed to. I think, you know, things will change quickly. You know, every day it's, you know, it's new science, new information about, um, about COVID-19 and who, you know, where the threat, what's the risk, those sorts of things. But I think for us, as we look at our phases, our, our phases may change a little bit. So as we, you know, we've planned now, we've planned a way to try to get into school. We want to execute that. Our hope is, you know, and evaluate that and get to phase two as quickly as possible. That's the adjust phase. Now, as we adjust, that's where choice starts to come in because not everybody's going to want to go into phase two. And I think the same thing will be true as we do the cycle again, as we get into phase three. And so, you know, Mike, you know, started to mention what I said earlier about 2.5, you know, there are going to be people that are going to want a part of a phase that we don't really have. It's, it's a, you know, maybe I want, you know, partial hybrid, partial um, all in uh, kind of thing. So I think uh, we're going to need to adjust. And I think um, this is true even about the previous slide that I talked about in terms of special education. You know, we're going to plan with you. We're going to execute. Um, you know, you may make decisions as a family. Uh, you're going to have to adjust. You may think like, well, I, I just wanted to stay all remote. And then you realize, well, wait a minute, this isn't working for us. I want to go, I want to go back. Um, you know, the rest of the district is in phase two. You know, I'm going to adjust and get to phase two. So I think we're doing this together. We're planning together. We're executing together. We're evaluating together and we're adjusting together. And I think Together as a community, our ultimate goal, remember, is we want to get everybody back to our new normal means, which means everybody's back full time and um, in, in the safest way possible. And I think uh, it's a very simple slide about how we're going to do it, but I think um, that's exactly what we're going to do. Plan, execute, evaluate, and adjust, and, and that's going to be ongoing. Um, so I know everyone's like, well, when will phase two start? Again, it's an arbitrary date in a lot of ways because October looks very, very different probably then August 4th, right? So 
it may be good news and we might be able to do it more quickly. Um, it just gives us a couple of weeks to kind of get going. And, and actually, you know, there's a benefit here is we'll, we'll become a lot better at remote learning, virtual learning, that whole experience, which I think if we are in a hybrid version for a long time, um, we'll have, I think we'll have strengthened probably the weakest of our two because I think the strongest, you know, if we look at strengths and weaknesses, we clearly are stronger uh, in person in classroom than our remote. So it'll give us an opportunity to work on that because I think if, if we were looking at this in a way, like what's more likely or less likely, uh, we're more likely to be in some sort of hybrid uh, model longer than we want to be. And so we need to be good at both. Um, our, our instructional and support staff is outstanding in terms of what they deliver in person and, and our, we are getting better remotely. So it'll give us an opportunity, plan, execute that, evaluate, you know, adjust, and then we're into the hybrid model. Um, and hopefully the hybrid model is not for long. I mean, I, you know, obviously the ultimate goal, once again, we want everybody back. We, we want it back to normal. So that, that's our plan. Thanks, Mike. So in regards to, you know, we've mentioned it a couple of times, how we'll be monitoring or determining when to switch in between phases or, or, or evaluation. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a pretty big discussion. You know, our team and, and teachers and everyone has been talking about this uh, since, since May 29th when we last saw each other um, virtually or remotely, however you want to describe it. But obviously some of the key points, just, just so everyone's more aware uh, and more transparent is, you know, weekly HT meetings, that's, that's full administrative teams in the district uh, meeting to discuss what's going on. Uh, you also have your build, building leadership um, at, at the local level, local level meeting, central school and middle school, um, as well as our, you know, our school district uh, safety committee, which involves uh, partners within the community, um, fire, police, um, so forth and so on. Um, it'll also continue to be a standing item on the school board meetings, um, discussion of where we are, how's it looking, what's going on. Um, kind of like we did here in the spring, you know, when, when, when the board was asking for some data review on, on performance assessments or, or things of that nature. We want to make sure that we're keeping an eye on, on everything that's going on. More specifically to the public health conditions, uh, what's going on in Hampstead, <clears throat> what's going on in Rockingham County, in southern New Hampshire. Um, and then obviously, uh, I think a lot of us sometimes feel like the rules are changing every day. So we have to continue to change rules and recommendations with the CDC, New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services, as well as, as the DOE. So Mike, if I could jump in here. Okay, yep. so I, I think this is an opportunity to, to, to really talk about, this is a plan that's being designed for our families and students, for our staff, you know, whether it's our instructional staff or whether it's the Paris people in the trenches, it's not a, something being done to them. And I think, I think that's important. And, I, and, I, and, and as far as communication, you know, I, I would hope that, I mean, there's a lot of people on this call. And so please don't be offended by what I'm going to say, but I, I, you know, it's been very helpful, the emails, right? We read them all. We, we take everything that you're saying into consideration and you need to know we want the same thing that you want, right? This is like what the community wants. We want the same thing, but we want it to be safe, right? Comments on Facebook in an echo chamber that aren't based on fact, that are just, they're not helpful. They're not, they're not, it's not helpful for anybody. It's not helpful for the plan. It's not helpful for the community. Um, and I know people are anxious. So I, I put it in that category. You know, we have anxious people that want information and, and really um, are hoping for more. Um, and and we, we're also hoping for more. We, we want what you want. So I, I would just say from a communication standpoint, please try to avoid jumping in the echo chamber and sharing misinformation and getting people all worked up when, you know, your emails are being read, you know, when you look at our frequently asked questions page, um, you're, you have a very responsive school board, you know, your administration is working closely with your, your unions to make sure that the people in the trenches, uh, you know, feel safe and comfortable with, with our students, with your kids, with my kids. So I think that's, that's all important things for people to consider because that other stuff's not helpful. So ask yourself, you know, is what I'm doing helpful or is it not helpful? And I think What's helpful is when you share your concerns with us in a, in a respectful way so that we can process and try to make it part of a plan. Um, and I'll, I'll just leave that at that. But I, again, I would avoid the echo chamber of misinformation. It's not helpful, right? So that's like, as we monitor and make determinations about how we can move from phase to phase, you know, your experience is shared in a very respectful way. And I have to say, you know, last Thursday night, that was, was an outstanding, um, you know, display of Hampstead, you know, we had 
countless people, one after another after another, in, in very respectful ways, um, sharing you know their personal um, views and, and experiences, and and that's all things that we took we were taking into consideration, which is really trying to get that really moved us to try to get to phase two two more quickly. So that wasn't a, a waste of time. That was I, I think it was very powerful because we went right back to the task force with looking at ways to, to try to move more quickly into phase two, because it, it sounded like, um, you know, the community would like for us to do that, but we want to do it safely. So on to our recommendation, Mr. Flynn. Yep. So uh, through, through the discussion, we're, we're, as a task force, uh, we are recommending that, that we begin uh, the 2020-21 school year in phase one, which would be virtual learning. I think the key to that sentence is begin. Um, you know, we, we've said repeatedly, um, we want to be back in school. Every teacher wants to be back in school. Um, it, it, it's, it's, we want to be with the children. Uh, there is no doubt about it. So we want to make sure that we're doing it the right way, the safest way, and appropriately. So in the second part of this presentation, we're going to go over uh, the safest ways for students and staff, responsibility, uh, responsible ways of returning during a pandemic, endorsements, um, and then as you see, the ability to adjust. And it goes back to that first, the, that first slide of guiding principles. Uh, we want to make sure that, that we're able to, to, to transition, least disruptive, and, and build some continuity. And, and we really feel like um, we've done a, a good job in, in the proposal of, on how to shift through phases. And Mike, um, if I could add to, you know, to the recommendation, you know, in the event that the recommendation is supported by the school board, you know, we're committed to within two weeks, you know, making sure that everyone has all the information they need about how we're starting. And we're also committed to finding ways to get to phase two as safely and quickly as possible. That's, and that would, that really gets to choice. So, you know, it's a short period of time. It's a sacrifice um, in some ways because we're not starting traditionally the day we, we normally would start. Uh, however, I think um, it, it provides us an additional opportunity um, to look at what happens around schools that did, did experiment and bring people back too quickly or, also gives us the opportunity to, um, you know, refine what remote learning looks like in ha Hampstead and um, an opportunity to smoothly transition into phase two. Um, I think that that's all important that things to figure out, you know, to, to take into consideration as, as you decide how you feel about our recommendation. And I'm not talking school board, I'm talking everybody on the call and everybody in the community as you, as you take in all this information and say, how do you really feel about the recommendation? So on to safety, Mike. Yeah, so obviously it's, it's become the main focus of, of, of our, um, you know, our safe learning task force. Um, uh, starting virtually uh, as a virtual learning model will obviously provide the lowest risk of, of spreading of COVID. Uh, but more importantly, it allows us uh, time to make adjustments and accommodations within our facility. Um, you know, it's, it, 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 it takes, it doesn't just happen overnight. That's the easiest way to say it. So, in regards to spacing and furniture, wash stations, uh, bathrooms, uh, we're going to have our, our HVAC evaluated and, and see what what we can do to possibly fix any type of airflow within the central school for our students. Water systems, we talked about having uh, other wash stations upstairs on the second floor without any running water. Um, those are all the things that um, you know Jeff Mackey has been already brainstorming and, and working on how we can get our students back in the facility safely. Um, obviously, cleaning. You know how often? What what chemicals are we buying? Uh, making sure that we have everything lined up so that once we are starting to bring people in, uh, you know, for six hours, six and a half hours a day, that we're making sure that that we're doing everything appropriately to keep everyone safe while there. Uh, on the second part of it, it allows you know people to be trained appropriately. Um, my wife is an ICU nurse and um, she speaks about how often some people are misinformed and not misinformed in the wrong way, but there's so much information out there uh, that people are almost overwhelmed. So we talked about bringing uh, infectious disease doctor in to speak to our staff um, on how and, and what is going on, how to protect yourself, how to protect the students when they're there. Uh, and then obviously that also leads into training our staff with appropriate procedures and protocols to make sure that, that we are doing everything to protect ourselves when we are within the facilities. So Mike, if, if you want me to jump in here on this OSHA. Um, sure. Slide. Now, yeah. you know, as, as, as anybody that's worked in an office or on a work site, you know, a lot of times when, when people feel like the work safe, the workspace or place or site is unsafe, 
you'll hear OSHA, and, and that's the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. You know, we're exempt from that jurisdiction, but the guidance is helpful. But I have to say, if, if when, you, when people throw OSHA around, it typically means somebody in charge has not been responsible making sure that the place is safe, right, so, for people to do to work. So whether it's air quality, you know, we've had issues in the past with, with mold or, or air quality concerns, and, and um, I, I know our, our unions would, would uh, agree with me, you know, it's been swift um, action taken by the Hampstead School District and school board in every single instance to make sure that our workspace is safe for students, safe for families when they're visiting, safe for staff to work there, uh, and, and this is no different. However, the, the guidance is, is a little bit different because it's, it's, in an, it's connected to the pandemic. So again, social distancing, they're, they're saying the same thing as CDC, six feet. Um, it mirrors much of the CDC guidance. Uh, provide the PPE to employees. So you know, those are, um, we talked about that. If, if we're gonna require masks, if we're gonna require special equipment to be, to be used, we're gonna make sure that, that we provide that to our employees. And, and certainly we even talked about providing to our students and uh, that, that we can talk more about that uh, as we move into the, the phases. You know, offer options to staff at higher risk for severe illness that limit their exposure to risk, um, to work from home, modify job responsibilities. You know, a big part of this when I was talking with, with our unions, it's really about flexibility. So, you know, we're, we need to be flexible and, and some of those decisions that people need to make are personal decisions. And so it's really not anybody else's business why somebody can or can't be at work. You know, if they have someone at home that is, is really at risk and they don't want to be the carrier to, to you know, we're, we're going to, we are going to work directly with our staff in the most flexible way to make sure that they feel safe and supported. And if they do come in our buildings in any way, shape or form, uh, obviously we need to make sure that that's as safe as we can possibly make it. You know, so it's facilities planning, obviously space planning. You know, we've already talked about HVAC. We, you know, that's, that's one of our concerns in both buildings is what, what can we do uh, and cleaning, you know, and making sure that, um, you know, we disinfect, you know, I'm sure you're in the same boat as us, you know, you, everybody's looking for cleaning um, supplies, you know, you can't find rubbing alcohol anywhere. You can't find Lysol wipes. You can't find, you know, making sure that we have the proper, um, you know, uh, materials and, and chemicals, if you will, to make sure that everything is as clean as possible. You know, we need to have a backup staffing plan, um, you know, obviously a cohort pod model to limit potential exposure. So, you know, taking a look at um, how we best use the space that we do have uh, to get to get the job done, whatever the job is, phase one, phase two, or phase three. Next slide, Mike. You know, and now the second question a lot of people said, you know, what's the liability? You know, in the, in the event that you open up school and, and, and God forbid, um, you know, we have a, a mass sickness, much like they've had in in many of the districts that have opened up in the, you know, across the United States, you know, we, we're, we're hearing about, you know, schools in Georgia or schools in, in other places that have opened up or almost in, in some instances, you didn't even have a chance to open up and they've already have 300, 400, you know, sick people. So, um, you know, what's the liability? Well, we, we, we're covered by Primex. That's a risk management exchange. Um, generally speaking, members would be most likely covered against third party claims for damages as long as their actions are in good faith and undertaken in the scope and course of their duties. You know, obviously, you know, in good faith, I mean, we're, we're in good faith trying to make this as safe as possible. In good faith, we're going to make sure that we have the proper cleaning materials. In good faith, we're going to make sure that we adhere to the OSHA standards and in a, in a safe place for, for students to be and for staff to be, um, whatever phase we're in and however we're going to do. You know, we have some other things to talk about tonight as far as, you know, how are we going to engage in athletics outside, after, you know, after school hours. How are we going to engage in that small group instruction for students with special disabilities that we need to, you know, all those sorts of things. We need to make sure that it's the safest place possible. So their recommendations, you know, adopt and adhere to an objective standard for operating. So we have the CDC adopt a comprehensive and realistic reopening plan. You know, we call it a safe learning plan, same idea, you know, phases, understand the circumstances will change, build in flexibility. You've heard me talk a little bit about flexibility. You know, we're not, we're not stuck on certain dates. We're not even stuck on certain data that's going to determine what we do as a community. You know, we're in good faith going to operate, take all the data, make, make the best decision in the most strategic, methodical way to make sure everybody's safe. And again, our goal to get everybody back into the building and, and experience our new normal. You know, document compliance with the operating standard and reopening plan, you know, safe learning plan, and develop and deploy an effective communication plan. You know, we, we want to be able to um, make sure that we're communicating, obviously, with staff uh, from the central office, with the board, certainly to the, the stakeholders, you know, our taxpayers, our families, 
uh, and most importantly to our students so that they really know what the expectations are and um, you know, if we're falling short, that they have a way to, to let us know that, you know, you're not meeting our needs and uh, you'll have an opportunity to adjust. If you think of that very simple slide, right, you know, we're going to adjust. Uh, we may need to adjust based on what student, student feedback as well as family feedback. So, you know, we're asking, you know, um, you know, I know I talked a little bit about ocean, a little bit about liability. You know, our, our ask here is, you know, that you support our safe learning plan. Um, to understand that that much has gone into this all the way down to liability and, and safe working conditions. Um, it, it's been a comprehensive look at, at what we think we can do and how we can do it. And, um, and we're committed. We're committed to get to phase two. And, and again, our, our ultimate goal of phase three, getting everybody back, um, you know, to, to our new normal about uh, all of us, you know, learning and, and, and uh, living together in, in our, our Hampstead school community. So, um, that's that's our, our liability slide. Um, Mike, uh, next slide. Responsible. So you want to jump in? Mike? I was muted. I was muted. Sorry. <laughs> Talked for quite some time there. Um, so our our group really wanted to be responsible when when delivering a recommendation to to the school board and the community, and you know it it, it is a hot topic. You know, everyone has an opinion on it. Um, I don't think I've ever been involved in anything within my profession in education in which uh, has been so uh, one side or the other. Um, it, it's been a challenge for sure. And it's a challenge with on the committee because people had different feelings and, and different things. We just wanted to make sure that we were responsible. Um, you know, New Hampshire and the Hampstead are doing great. Um, and we wanna make sure that we maintain and we don't become part of the problem. Um, and, and it's, it, 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 it's the appropriate time to continue to, to make sure that we are doing everything to prevent, um, you know, people say it affects children, um, not as much. That's a fair, fair discussion point, but it's also, we don't, we don't want to be the ones in which, uh, there was a massive outbreak, uh, because of, we didn't have, uh, or, or we're doing things appropriately. So we just want to make sure we're being responsible. Uh, the other thing we, we have to keep, keep in mind is, you know, we have 185 adults coming to our facilities every day, and not all of them live in Hampstead. You know, they do live in Manchester, and they do live in Nashua and the Seacoast. So it's something to keep in mind that it's not just Hampstead that will be within the facilities uh, each day. Uh, it, are, it is in our, excuse me, it is people from around the state uh, who are also in different areas with, with the virus. Yeah, Mike, and if I could add to that, you know, um, you know we're, we're on the border, right? So we talk about staff living all around New Hampshire. We have staff coming from Massachusetts as well, right? So, you know, and I have, I have a great deal of respect for Dr. Fauci. But when I read this comment, part of the experiment, I don't want the kids, our kids, your kids, to be part of any experiment. I want to know what's, you know, what are, our, what are our best odds to keeping everybody safe? So if there's an experiment going on and and bad things are happening, um, we certainly don't want to be part of that experiment, right? So in the event that we have data from other places that help us get to phase two more quickly, that's great. Um, we also might get data that says phase two is not a great idea. So I think in a very conservative way, we're taking, a, again, a very strategic and methodical approach to, you know, a safe learning plan that has that goal in mind of getting everybody back to school but when we start talking about experiment and children, that, that, that's just a bad idea, right? It's just a bad idea. And so, um, you know, I think our commitment to safety here uh, in our reopening plan speaks to OSHA, speaks to liability, speaks to what's in the best interest of our families, our children, certainly our staff. Um, you know what? You know, people said, you know, what's, what's the number? Well, the number is one for me. One person gets really sick. One person ends up in the hospital. One person, God forbid, passed away. That's too many, right? So I think we need to do everything we can to make sure we're as safe as we possibly can be as we go from phase one to phase two. And again, to our ultimate goal of getting everybody back into school. Thanks, Mike. So the next slide is endorsements. And Mike, I didn't know if you, you know, endorse. I was on mute again. This is yours again. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, you know, we talk about what's, what's an endorsement. Again, we, we talked about working collaboratively. So, you know, we throw out the word negotiation. Negotiation sounds like, you know, people have leverage and they're trying to work an angle. That really was not what we did. We collaboratively worked together on a safe, you know, a safe learning plan 
and so our endorsement. So we put our task force together. We broke into subcommittees. They've endorsed it. Um, so appreciative of both um, Kara Gordon, all of HEA, Lisa Lambert, all of Haas, you two Jill Owens, I know you're on the call. Um, you know, they were, you know, they were really students. They, they really listened and they brought a lot to the table and they um, kept kind of opinions, you know, at bay for a while. And, and, and for some people, they had to warm up to this because they're eager to get back as well. I said this right at the opening. Um, our safe learning plan has nothing to do with them not willing. They are willing to do whatever it takes, but they want to do it in, safe, in a safe way possible. So, you know, I appreciate both HEA and HAS, you know, the, our unions, you know, we have their endorsement. Our school nurses, you know, people said, where's your medical professions on this? You know, nobody wants to be the, you know, the face of this. I mean, because we all want that end game, right? We all want to all be back together, right? So I'm not saying that they wouldn't, but, you know, our nurses are, are endorsing what we're doing because they looked at that OSHA, they looked at the way that we were talking about safety and, and, and they were endorsing it. Same with our administrative team, um, looking at, you know, both of our teams, you know, um, Principal Danola and her team, Principal Collins and his team, um, the instructional staff, all the support staff, everybody wants the ultimate goal of getting back, but they all want to do it safely. So, you know, we have the endorsement of, of the people that are doing the work, the people that are in the trenches. Um, you know, if there are people taking risks, certainly families take risks when they send students uh, to school. And, you know, staff in the trenches are taking the, the greatest risk because they're, they're the people on the front line. And, and really their, their voice was really the loudest voice in a lot of ways, um, but it wasn't about, I want to get back to it. They're willing to do whatever they need to do. And they're willing to work with us in any way possible. But they also were committed to safety. And I think that's where we all got to a common ground of, let's be safe, let's look at a phased approach, and let's have a goal of getting to phase two quickly. And then an ultimate goal of phase, you know, phase three, which is, is really, once again, our new normal of everybody being back together. So uh, those are our endorsements. And so we're, uh, we were happy to put those uh, in, as part of the presentation. Okay. So the, one of the, the areas of emphasis is clearly, as we've mentioned repeatedly, about how, how we delivered from March uh, to June and how we want to re-deliver. And it, it's, it's imperative that clearly that... Um, what we what we need to do uh, is be far more uh, proactive and, and, and prepared. Uh, anyone that thinks uh, any district that's going back uh, immediately in hybrid or, or all in or whatever it may be, that there is not going to be disruptions, whether someone comes in testing positive uh, or a teacher comes in testing positive and, and then the students have to quarantine, uh, that they'll be doing virtual instruction. Uh, this will allow us to, to certainly plan and prepare far better, uh, as we've mentioned, we can open the doors tomorrow and, and, and teach in person. It, that's a no-brainer. But beginning in phase one will allow us to plan and prepare uh, for all those inconsistencies that may occur throughout the, the 2021 school year, depending on, on how all this goes within the state. That'll allow us to do far more extensive training in, in Zoom and Google Meeting. Uh, it'll allow us to do far more training within Classroom and Seesaw so that our teachers um, are not just becoming familiar with it, but become uh, more of a, an expert within it as if we were using a tool within our classroom. Uh, it also allows us time to appropriately plan curriculum and assessments. Um, it's, it was challenging in, in May, in, in, excuse me, April, May, and June, when you're trying to say, all right, what am I doing this week? Uh, what are we doing next week? When, when your typical model had always been, okay, I'm at this checkpoint, this is where my students should be, this is what they should be doing. But clearly through the disruption of what happened in the spring, we need to do a better job for, for what's going to be happening in the fall. And whether when we transition to a hybrid or as we've mentioned to, to, to full return, we want to make sure that we don't lose the continuity of the curriculum and the classrooms. Um, and that also allows time for materials preparation. One of the bigger things coming out of uh, you know, our, our, the task force group was we want to be able to get materials in the students' hands. You know, if we're passing out Chromebooks, can we pass out materials? Um, to help us uh, to, to build that continuity of, of, of virtual learning. And, and that will allow us time to do that. And then lastly is, is allowing t uh, preparation at grade level and team time. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into uh, planning two types of models uh, and, and going from virtual to hybrid, hybrid to all in. Uh, that, that's a lot, a lot of transition, uh, a lot of change um, and allowing these people to, to prepare uh, will give us more continuity uh, whatever uh, whatever phase we are in it at any time. 
Now, remember, as we talked about fluid and, and assessing and, and doing, uh, we, could, we could be all in in full, full return, let's just, let's just say by November, and then an outbreak occurs and we have to go back to, to hybrid. We're going to be more prepared than ever because that's how we began. Students will be prepared because that's how they began. They'll have a better understanding of what they're doing, how to log on, how to connect with their teachers, rather than uh, being unprepared. So this will allow certainly more time to prepare and learn for virtual learning. And, you know, we've mentioned it a couple times. So it's the ability to adjust. We want to be great at virtual learning. We don't want to be okay. We don't want to be in crisis. We don't want to be, uh, you know, planning uh, by, by the seat of our pants. We want to make sure that, that we're great at it because um, we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, talk about planning for the unknown. Uh, we all wish we had, uh, you know, an idea of, of, you know, a vaccine or this going away, or, or maybe we can, uh, the colder months, it'll be better, or, or maybe the flu, flu season is going to come around and it'll be worse. But, but being able to be great at virtual learning for having the planning and preparation, it'll allow those transitions of, of if or when things happen. Um, it won't be so much of uh, what do I do next? The students will know, okay, I'm going to be home for a couple of days or whatever it may be. I've done this before. I feel confident. Uh, we already have those schedules designed, those structures in place. Uh, it certainly allows for, for that opportunity at home. It goes back to the outbreaks, um, and, and we said it before. We could open the doors and teach in classrooms. Uh, that's not an issue for us. Uh, we want to make sure that we're, that we're great, which allows us to probably one of the biggest question marks, uh, excuse me, which, which leads us to one of the probably the biggest question marks is, all right, how long? When do we start looking at this? Uh, and the task force all agreed upon uh, the first checkpoint, we'll call them checkpoints, uh, is the week of October 12th. So by October 12th, uh, we will be ass assessing what's going on uh, through the monitoring uh, discussion we had. Uh, and then there's a board meeting on the 20th uh, and we'll be making uh, our recommendation to the board on, on what we're, sh what we're going to be doing. And I know Dr. Metzler is going to cut me off any second here because he's going to say, he, he's going to say dates are arbitrary, Mike. Dates are arbitrary. Yeah. Am I right? Well, so, you know, and, and being honest here, um, you know, I had, um, I had an earlier date kind of in mind, you know, in magic dates, October 1st and, uh, you know, several members of the task force, you know, mentioned, you know, they talked about quarantine and, and if somebody gets sick in the first two weeks of school and 14 days. And so the other piece about this too, you're right, the dates are arbitrary. So we can adjust that date. I mean, if, if we have data, we have reason to believe that we can shift into phase two earlier then we will. Um, but the other part was being sensitive to staff as we asked them to plan. Um, Cause I'll get back to the top part of this where you said, we want to be great at virtual learning. We want to be, um, you know, in, in order for our staff to have an opportunity uh, to get really good at, at something, we, we need to allow them to plan for it and stick to it. I, I don't want to be in the business of on Friday um, telling them they're doing something different on Monday, again, creating our own crisis, you know, um, you know, adjusting to a crisis is one thing, um, be, given the opportunity to do professional development, plan and execute. So again, those four circles, right? So we, we're going to plan, we're going to execute, um, you know, we'll, we'll adjust and, uh, and, and do what we need to do. So I think that's where I, I want people to be comfortable with. We want to give teachers an opportunity to do the professional development plan. And I think that week of October 12th is probably, it'll come quickly. I know it's, it sounds like a long time with four weeks. The other part was the start date. You know, um, you know, the governor has been kind of after all of us for, for years now to start after Labor Day um, because of tourism. And this is not tourism. This is a pandemic. But, uh, you know, it's late this year. You know, Labor Day is the 7th of September. And that's why we got into the 14th, I think, um, with some, with some uh, professional development. You know, the commissioner has allowed some professional development. Again, we count hours, not days necessarily. Last year, if you, you, you realize we, we ended up ending early. Um, we're not going to impact your school vacation. So I, you know, I'm going to tell families, you know, plan, you know, I know people have vacations. What's that? I mean, it, it's important for families to spend time together. I think families are now you're probably thinking like we spent enough time together. Um, but I think if you're, if you have vacations, you can plan for them. Um, we're not going to, uh, you know, rip the carpet from under your feet at the last minute and say like, Oh, February is gone or April's gone. So, you know, we'll stay committed to that. Uh, again, you know, I want to say it again, you know, our, our transition from phase one to phase two, we want to do that as quickly as, and efficiently and safely as possible and, and get to that final goal of getting everyone um, back all at once. You know, we have some, you know, people are saying, you know, what do we have for funds? The school board's been awesome uh, up front saying, basically, whatever you need, 
whatever you need, whatever you need, whatever you need. So, you know, uh, right out of the box, you know, we, we have some technology needs, you know, Mr. Flynn had mentioned that earlier about Chromebooks and, and, and services, you know, if people don't have Wi-Fi or whatever, you know, whatever we need to do to help um, make sure that everyone has what they need so they can be successful. You know, it's hard for our teachers to be great if they don't have access to our students and, uh, or if our, if our technology isn't, isn't up to speed. So I think that's important as well. Um, but I didn't know if you had anything else you wanted to add there, Mike, in terms of action. Yeah, I just, um, I, I want to reiterate a couple of things. One, it would be the technology. You know, this ev with this action item, every student in grades one through eight would have a Chromebook. Um, that means every family, every student, not if you have two kids, whatever it is, every student that is enrolled in our system would have a Chromebook. Um, and it's important because that was one of uh, the things in the emails to the task force is, you know, we really struggled with having enough, t enough technology in our house. I had four kids and, you know, I only had one middle school and three. So, so we really felt as a task force to be great at, at virtual learning, we had to make sure that people had the appropriate devices within their hands. The other thing when we, when we were discussing the, the date, um, you know, he mentioned vacations and, and things of that nature, but I just, again, we were talking about perspective and what we went through, you know, at the end of last year, we removed 12 days from the school calendar because of our appropriate hours. So starting at this time would not impact uh, the school calendar. Um, it, it would allow for the professional development and training and, and, and the, the setting up of the facilities, those types of things. Um, but it, it, it does not impact, um, as he mentioned, the other things within the school calendar. Hey Mike, moving on. Now this 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 particular series of slides, um, the frequently asked questions. You know, we set up a, an email address uh, for the task force to get, you know, people who were interested in sending in questions or or how they felt about certain things or, or helped us a number of ways. So I asked uh, Mr. Flynn and, and the team if we could somehow find a way to, you know, kind of categorize, kind of take the emails and put them into a series of, of questions, if you will, with with answers, you know, so I'll, I'll go through this quickly because I know our board will, will have some questions um, uh, for our answers. Um, so who's on the safe learning task force? You know, we, we pretty much allowed everyone that worked here that wanted to be part of it. Um, you know, initially we were talking about a certain, a certain number and representation from, from different parts and we just said, hey, everybody that wanted to be on it could be on it. I know there are questions as to community members, but again, um, we were charged with with coming up with a recommendation uh, that we felt um, was safe. Now we had community members, um, and they were selected for different reasons. Uh, and I, I appreciate their input. Um, and I would say anybody that sent in an email really was part of the task force because uh, your emails were were considered and were part of our discussions. And certainly, um, but you can imagine once you get to fifty something, you know, you know how how many more people. Um, so you know, we broke into small subcommittees as as we indicated earlier, but you'd say, oh, well, who's on, you know, who were the people on? And we were, we were very careful because we wanted those people to be able to, in their own kind of way, participate in a confidential kind of way. Um, now, you know how crazy that sounds, right? So I have 50 people and we think that what we're talking about is confidential, right? Uh, you know, <laughs> of course, information got out and, 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 and that, was, that was part of a problem in a sense because we were trying to make sure that we didn't, uh, we wanted to make sure that the information that we got out that was accurate and that we were solid in our approach in terms of a methodical strategic way. Um, you know, that's good and bad, you know, transparency is great in some ways and uh, in many ways, obviously, and we were trying to be transparent about the process. It really was to come to the school board uh, with a, with a recommendation on August 4th, which is this evening, which is what we do, we're doing. Um, will my student have to wear a mask all day? Mask will be required to be worn age appropriate students at the central school. All students will be required to wear a mask at the middle school. Obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about phase two and potentially phase three. HVAC, will the HVAC system be addressed, uh, assessed rather? Yes, we've had, we have several quotes to evaluate our HVAC systems. Um, Jeff Mackey's done a great job. We're, we're well aware of the work that needs to be done there. Uh, what will the cleaning protocols in the schools be? The deep cleaning will occur in the classroom at the end of each day. Cleaning and disinfecting procedures will follow CDC guidelines. Bathrooms will be cleaned throughout the day and buses will be cleaned after every run. So, um, you know, we're going to do what we need to do. Again, getting cleaning materials is, can be challenging, but we'll, um, we'll, we'll get that done. Uh, will outdoor spaces be used? Certainly, you know, if they're safe, outdoor spaces will be utilized, certainly when weather permits. Um, we, we obviously we want to, uh, and when we talk about school sports and activities that are outside of school, uh, anything that we can do, that's what's made it, um, somewhat easier for, 
for some summer camps and daycares and those sorts of things to operate during the summer months. You know, we're well aware of New England, right? So our weather changes quickly, you know, and, and whether it's mosquitoes or whether it's sunburn or whether it's allergies or whether it's, you know, rain or sleet or, or, or snow, uh, you know, we have, we have uh, a lot of things that are challenging for us. Next slide, Mike. Um, bigger font. This is good for me. Uh, can the district <laughs> supply my student a Chromebook? Um, Mike, you know, Mr. Flynn has indicated we're, we're in the process of trying to get, uh, make sure that we're one-to-one. -one. Will remote learning be the same as in the spring? Absolutely not. I indicated last meeting, you know, it, it, uh, it will be better. It will be enhanced. It will be something, uh, you know, it's going to include direct instruction. We're going to have small group sessions with interventions, remediation, office hours, and more structure on a daily basis. So I think that structure will help families feel a lot differently than they did last spring with what, which I consider was a crisis response, not necessarily our best uh, crack, if you will, at, uh, at virtual learning. Um, how will my student receive services required by the IEP? I addressed that earlier, but again, administration, special education teachers, paraeducators, related service providers are committed to working together with families to support students remote and or in-person safely. Yes, there will be some in-person in phase one for students that need services. That will be done on an individual basis based on the contract, that IEP that you have, uh, and working directly with uh, Francine Flynn, our director, uh, and her staff. Uh, when will the student know their schedule? Student schedules for remote learning will be communicated from building administration. Uh, when tr transitioning to phase two, schedules will be communicated one week prior to the uh, um, transition. You know, we're, we're committed to, um, in the event that our recommendation is supported, uh, within two weeks, you know, with, by August 18th, really having this all kind of flushed out for phase one. So um, I know that people say, you know, can you do it in two weeks? One thing people, you know, understand, you know, we got out of school in late May and your administrative staff started the planning. Now, I know that didn't feel all that transparent, but these are discussions that we've and, and work that we've been working on, you know, countless hours. Um, you know, and, and so we expanded when we were ready to take action. So, uh, you know, having a task force work for two months probably isn't as efficient. So, again, this is the same thing here. Our, our subcommittees, you know, giving them two weeks uh, to pull together all those details at the building level and, and, and in our special ed world, I think, um, you know, we'll get that done. So August 18th is really our, our, our target date for that phase one. And, again, we're talking about we'll give a, a full week's notice um, prior to phase two. Uh, how will staff and students be screened prior to school following CDC guidelines, state guidance for screening procedures? Uh, fall sports be happening, you know, and Nancy Benson, you know, we have a, we have a great sports program and it's because we have great leadership with our athletic director at our middle school and in our school. Uh, she had a league meeting um, just recently. They're finalizing plans. You know, she, she reached out. I said, just keep us in the game. You know, we want to participate uh, she said, well, what if we're all remote learning? You know, can we do it? Yeah, yes, we can. We, we want to do as much as we can for our, our kids uh, in the safest way possible. I certainly didn't want to, you know, jump into phase two, you know, two weeks after we were in phase one and then not have any middle school athletics because we weren't uh, in the game. So she's, she's working out those details and uh, she, she just does a great job with scheduling and certainly making sure that all of our coaches and, and athletes will have all the opportunities that we can provide to them. Uh, in the safest way possible. So, so thank you. Thank you, Nancy, if you're on the call. And That's finally, it. do you have any questions for our answers? I guess we're asking the school board. Well, first, I want to thank both of you for this extensive presentation. I would like to thank all of the task force members who spent time on this, all of our administration who has spent time on it. Um, as a personal note, that was incredibly comprehensive and I really, really appreciated it. You both helped me understand a lot of what has been going on um, and being looked at the last weeks and months. Um, before, do we wanna do a motion before questions, board members? We're not gonna vote before we ask questions. I just wanna get the motion on the floor and then open it for discussion, which is technically how we generally do our motions and discussions, if that's okay with everybody else. I'm not seeing anyone objecting, so, okay. Um, I'll make Jim, a motion. Okay, so what, Jim, how do you wanna phrase this? I'd like to make a motion to accept the recommendation 
of the Safe Learning Task Force to begin the 2021 school year, virtual remote, calling out two specific dates in the future. One by August 18th to have a fully flushed out vetted remote plan. And by early October, a date to be decided to have a fully fleshed out vetted hybrid model. Does that sound accurate dates, Dr. Messler? I think that's perfect. I think the date, you know, we said the week of October 12th, but the school board can certainly set any date they want, you know, that, that, that will work for us. We are flexible either way, uh, earlier or later, um, I, you know, so, uh, and that August 18th date is a date we've already committed to in terms of subcommittee work uh, getting ready, so. Caitlin, I'll second that motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Now I would like to go to any questions or discussions. I know we have questions. Oh yeah. <laughs> Mostly they're all over the place. Yeah. All right. Can I start getting a little bit with a, let's go a layup right now. Just a real quick, easy question, hopefully for Mr. Flynn. Okay. Um, Mr. Flynn, you said that we need to get 200 Chromebooks. Is that 200 Chromebooks um, allow for extra for when a student misses, you know, drops it, breaks it, software messes up, um, or is that 200 just for the bare minimum? What, what does that give us for a percentage of overage for our students? Uh, that, that will give us overage. We work with children every day and we know what will happen. So um, that will allow, the tech team had did the math, that will allow with appropriate loaners and loan time as they repair or fix whatever's needed okay. so that no one would be without a device. And the lead time on getting those 200, because I'm sure there's a lot of... Uh, yeah, so uh, we, as, as we've mentioned, we've been way ahead of this. So it's actually out for official bid. Um, it's been out for about a week, just in anticipation. You wanted to stay on top of the timeline. But we've been in touch with uh, a couple of our people who are submitting bids, and all of them um, pretty much assured us that by that September 14th deadline, we should be A-OK. -okay. David, do you want to keep, do we just want to go like person by person here? I, I guess we can hop around. Now I can check Chromebooks off my list. Yeah, I had the, I actually had the same question as David about lead time of getting them. So that goes, there goes that one. Uh, so go ahead, Jim. We'll, ju we'll jump around. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess the first thing I want to say, um, you know, I want to say thank you to everybody on the, the uh, task force and the parents submitting questions, I appreciate it. Uh, to me, uh, you know, to, to recommend this and to vote for this, uh, safety is, is number one. I know Dr. Metzler used the term passed away and I, and I don't like and never thought I would say the word dead and deaf at a school board meeting and hope kids aren't listening, but I'm the facts. Um, 158,000 people dead in the United States. 500 people a day right now. We're pulling up on three quarters of a million people soon. It's, I think five, over 5,000 people are dying a day in the world. Um, I will not roll the dice with my kids or yours. And I'm not saying you are, if you wanted to send them back right now, but my vote is to go remote to start. I want my kids to go back so bad. I want my life to go back to normal. Um, but I just wanted to start off with that. I have a lot of questions, um, but I am not rolling on the dice. I'm sorry. Um, and that's my opinion. Thank you. I'll, I'll uh, throw some questions in there when I, other people get to speak. You don't want to start with a question? Um, <clears throat> so I want to make sure that when we do the Chromebooks, um, families in need get wireless too. I think you might have talked about that, but I just want to, I don't, I'm not going to jump back to the slide to double check, but I want to make sure we offer the opportunity to pay for, supply, hook them up with an internet service if they don't have it. So in the, in the spring, we, we did our best working with Comcast and the local facilities. Um, utilities, excuse me, utility companies mm -hmm. to ensure uh, that all of our families were able to do that. 
if they had an outstanding balance, we worked with them to make sure that it was waived. Um, so we'll certainly continue to make sure that uh, we are providing access for our families. Okay, I'll just, I'll throw out another one right now. So I, I, I don't know much about the IEP world at all, but I, I know that the most vulnerable kids we probably have that, that need to get back as soon as possible. Do you think during this online portion, before we go hybrid, do you think there's an opportunity um, if everybody's safe for the most in need to, to get back to a one-on-one, -on -one, whether at, at home or at school? Mike, I'll, uh, I'll take that. Yeah, that, that's um, Jim and, and the rest of the board. That, that's an absolute yes. That's something we're working on. So those contracts, you know, through Francine Flynn, our, our director, uh, right now is figuring out capacity and we'll have an opportunity to figure out exactly what students we can bring in, what students need to be visited at home. You know, there's a testing component, by the way, that we can't do um, virtually. It's, it's, it's impossible. So, you know, there, there are some things that we have to do and, um, and we want to do. And so we'll, we'll do them as safely as possible. So the answer is, yes, we'll be working that out. It's on an individual basis. And again, um, I ask, you know, families to be a little patient um, just because we need to make sure we have the capacity and willingness to be able to, to execute which we will one way or another, but that may take a little bit of time, not a lot of bit of time. Um, we certainly, you know, we're planning now. So hopefully we'll be able to hit the ground running, you know, that first week of, uh, of school, the 14th of September. Could you tell me what age appropriate means for masks in central school? Without, you know, you don't have to give me your official response, but are you sure. thinking more you know, second, third, and fourth, or what are you thinking? So if, if you're going to hold me not to the official response, uh, it's... No, I'm not going to hold you to this. A okay. lot of people might, it, but I won't. No, that, and that's fine. And, and again, those are the things, the, the, the challenge that we have determining age appropriate specifically right now is because we don't know what it'll look like at our next checkpoint. If I was going to say right now, I think we would lean more towards, you know, third and fourth graders, we're gonna have multiple mask breaks throughout the day. Um, it's really about focusing on protecting everyone and, and learning. Um, and then as they become more understanding, if our desks are socially distanced, we can make sure all those protocols are in place. Um, but if my non-official answer, uh, the task force discussed about third and fourth grade. Um, it, it's challenging because you have, I mean, you have all the way from pre-K through third, fourth grade in that school, um, but it, that is the unofficial answer. Okay. Thank you. I, one more question and I'll let other, I just wanted to, um, some employees, um, I don't know if everybody's going to have a role to play with this online portion um, because they might be not be delivering content to people. I just want to make sure, I mean, for me, that our employees, are, their job is safe. Yeah, I can, I can speak to that. You know, um, so I don't want to get into, well, it'd be easy to tell what group, but so there were people that were worried, um, you know, how we use, like Haas, for instance, I'll say it, Haas has our, our, more, our most diversified group. You know, they, they come with, with skills that range and life experience that range and what can and can't they do. Well, they were a little worried about how we were going to use them and, and, and began to think like, well, if we weren't using them, um, you know, potentially we would need them and, and, and we would, we would uh, we'd be shrinking that workforce. Uh, quite the contrary, um, we're, we're trying to find creative and clever ways to use them. Uh, that's part of Francine Flynn's work, you know, with our special ed population, but certainly um, trying again, to find out what's our capacity, what are people willing to do, what are they able to do, um, how can we use our power, how can we better use our powers, uh, but certainly their job's safe. Uh, we haven't looked to reduce any jobs, in, including our SRO, who we need very much even during this, this period of time. And I'll, I'll be working with the chief and, and certainly um, our board of selectmen on that in, in the near future, hopefully. I know there were some questions. Um, I did not have an opportunity to speak with them directly yet, but we will shortly. But no, we need our, we need our full staff. And, you know, especially as we get into the hybrid, you know, if we have some students in, some students home, we have some staff that can come, some staff that can't. You know, again, that's that flexibility piece. So we're, we're going to need, um, we're going to need all sorts of 
uh, people in different roles and you know and, and quite frankly we might be asking people to do some things that aren't necessarily in technically in their job description and, and see you know how they can pitch in but I think now, that's been really the Hampstead way in terms of climate and culture. Um, anytime um, Hampstead does something in either school, uh, everybody pitches in uh, and, and the people aren't holding up job descriptions. So uh, I feel good about it, but the short answer is no, everybody, everybody's jobs are safe and we're certainly just trying to find out the best way to, to, to maximize um, what they can bring to the table to help us be successful with all three of these phases. Thank you. Okay, anybody else want to jump in? There, question. Megan? Yes. Um, so, Dr. Metzler has been talking a lot about collaborating and working together. Um, the, we looked at the chart, plan, do, evaluate, adjust. So, maybe the answers to these questions are obvious, but I'll ask them anyways. Um, the first one is, Will the task force email distribution remain open throughout all three phases? Um, and then will the same 50 members be on the task force that will be meeting weekly um, to reassess, evaluate? Uh, so Megan, so, so really good question. Um, and, and it's not an obvious answer because as you asked the question, I was thinking about a better answer than perhaps we could leave that open, but I think we should probably have one that's specific to each phase, right? So as we wrap up, this is our opening plan. We should start, an, we should start another one. This will be the phase one kind of feedback loop, you know, and then phase two and then phase three. Uh, and, and so what we did too was as far as the group, the group was not a, a finite number in a sense, because I realized that once they bring in the subcommittee and they really started working on schedules at the particular buildings, more staff is going to want to be part of those those committees, right? Maybe they didn't know what the uh, safe learning task force would do. Uh, maybe they didn't realize that they'd have as much input as they have. But I, I think the short answer to your question is I, I think that the task force will grow at least in the subcommittee work because I know Principal Collins and Principal Danola as they go about those schedules um, will need to involve more people uh, as they as they design um, something for everyone. So that's the, uh, the the short answer to those two questions. Okay. Um, I do have a comment as well, if nobody else wants to. Um, oh, okay. Go ahead, Megan. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, thank you first to the task force. Um, certainly a lot of detail um, tonight, very helpful. Um, especially when there's, as Mr. Flynn was saying, so many conflicting opinions and sources um, for every Crow return to school article, you'll find one to negate it or um, offset it and say, we shouldn't be going back to school. Um, I do, so I do appreciate everything that the task force has done, um, but I do want to share one part of the process that I think um, maybe could have been handled more thoughtfully, and it's communication. Um, for weeks, we as the community have been hearing of this task force, um, but not much else beyond that. Um, I knew they were hard at work, but um, everything was kind of remained silent. Um, and I understand there's certain reasons um, for that. Uh, we were told we would have, we meaning the community, um, we would have the opportunity for input and I was a little surprised to see that it was a week before um, tonight where the task force, Mr. Flynn um, and Dr. Metzler are presenting the plan to the board for, um, to be voted on. Um, you know, it almost seemed as though the public forum, and I'm sure this wasn't the case, but it almost seemed like it was just for show. Um, and, um, you know, didn't really give us enough time to digest the questions and come back with the answers. Um, you know, we did have 15, I counted them. I, I took notes on everything everybody said last week. Um, it was all really good information, lots of, um, lots of good feedback. And there was certainly a common theme and that was um, having choice as we've said throughout this, or Dr. Metzler and Mr. Flynn have said throughout this presentation. Um, and I understand that's a very hard thing to accommodate um, in such a short amount of time and um, just given the nature of what we're going through. Um, you know, I, I think maybe, um, you know, if we could set something up on the Hampstead website, 
um, a, a page or a web link that can house all of this information um, and, you know, keep the community um, up to par or let the, uh, keep them updated, um, not just through um, emails saying, oh, the, the task for subcommittees are meeting this week. Um, but I think, you know, in times like these, while over communication can be bad uh, or, you know, have a negative impact, I think, um, you know, in circumstances like these, it, it could be beneficial. Um, as far as the plan, um, so <laughs> I'm torn. Uh, my focus is to remain objective as a school board member. Um, we all have our own personal touches that we can add to the, these discussions. Um, but I sit here as a member of the school board and think to myself, um, I can't really let those biases and personal motives uh, dictate the in full how I um, speak in these public meetings or choose to vote. Um, the proposed plan is the absolute safest option for the physical well-being of our children. Uh, it's very clear. Um, but there's more to our children. I understand physical safety is very important, but there's more to our children than that. Um, I have a hard time thinking to myself that this is the safest option for their emotional and mental well-being. Um, I understand that our schools are not equipped to get our children back in there um, today, tomorrow, September 14th. Um, but phase one, uh, we all want it to be short-lived. It's just to hold me over. Um, it's not sustainable and it's not the way I want my kids going back to school. Um, you know, I could go on all night and I won't about outdoor learning, but um, you know, I really think there's an opportunity there to take a look and reinvent the learning experience um, for our kids. I, there's all kinds of theories on uh, COVID, but mother nature is telling us that we need to get our children outside. Um, we don't want our children and teachers stuck in front of a screen for six hours a day, four days a week, or however it ends up being. Um, I don't want my kids stuck inside a building for at, at a table or a desk for six hours a week. Um, you know, the reason I joined the school board is because I want to better the, the holistic child. And um, I, I feel this presentation, while it was very detailed and well laid out, it really only focused on the physical, not only, but the primary focus was the physical. And I don't think we can just um, lose sight of how this will impact our kids and the teachers emotionally and mentally. Um, so you know, I'm torn. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how I feel about it. Um, I just, you know, this phase one has to be short lived. We all want it to be. And if we can't get to phase two um, in the hybrid model, we have to get creative and get our kids back in the learning environment that's not in front of a screen. Um, sorry. Oh, Can I yes, respond just quickly? Yep. I think, um, you know, Megan, Megan well said, and I think, um, you know, we all, we all, we all feel the same way. It was, you know, really coming up with what we believe was a safe learning plan. But I think one thing I hope, I, I just like everybody's confidence in this regard, like, and, and Caitlin, you can attest to this on my behalf. You know, we were at choice. That's what we started at. And we kind of worked our way around into safe, made choice more difficult. I can tell you without a shadow of, you know, without any reservation that, that public forum, forum last week got me back to choice and, and a phase, a quicker transition to phase two, which is really the last piece to what Megan was talking about. So it, it was time well spent. I know people felt like, oh, well, you know, decisions had already been made. And, and that's, not, that's not true. It can look that way. It really isn't true. I think it, um, it really changed, at least it changed my view on what I wanted to recommend in terms of what I thought we could do safely and quickly. Um, Again, we don't know what 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 the you know what New Hampshire is going to look like or, or anything else by by the middle to the end of September. But we're hoping we get good data and and we can make that that smooth transition to phase two quickly and and offer choice. So, um, you know, I appreciate I appreciate the comments. We certainly need to be creative and we will be. Um, a hybrid model is you, we're going to have to be creative and um, and, and we're going to have have to use people in in ways perhaps that they. Um, 
haven't been used in the past to to get get the job done. But uh, we're committed to that, and uh, I appreciate the comments. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, David, do you have any? I'm just kind of looking around. Yeah, yeah I've got a few. Um, okay. Some some check boxes here of um, the HVAC. Has that? I. I I heard that we're gonna get it assessed or that it's out to be quoted to be assessed. Um, can you tell us what's going on with that right now? Mike, if you would, the details on the um, plan for yeah, the assessment. Yeah, um, I, I can't, there's, there's a lot of people in the room. I, I know we've been on, so as we've been talking about acquiring PPA, PPE and things of that nature, as you can imagine, there was quite a long list for uh, assessing of the HVAC. Jeff, I'm trying to find Jeff so I can unmute him. I believe Jeff Dow can speak to ABCD. All right, there we go. Thank you, Mike. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, so we do have a uh, quote to have our um, HVAC systems in the schools um, reviewed or that our fresh air intake is uh, sufficient. I think it's important to remember that we don't have a, uh, like a COVID proof standard. There's no sort of silver bullet for um, COVID-related HVAC um, assessment. What we do know is that the um, fresh air um, intake into the building seems to be of paramount uh, importance. And we've spent, uh, our, our maintenance crew and um, uh, facilities crew have spent time this summer to make sure that the systems that we have in place are working and operating as efficiently and as effectively as possible. We're still completing that process. So as we go through that process of making sure that all of our um, intake and exhaust um, blowers and motors are working. Uh, we have the proper filtration in place to uh, cope with the environment that we're in. Um, once that's in place, we will have an assessment done on, on our systems in both buildings. And um, we're looking to um, have that done probably within in the next uh, a month or so. But I think that would be a lot more effective um, after we're able to maximize the capabilities of our system as it stands right now. Um, is there any reason why we weren't able to do that sooner? Only because we knew that it would be, of course, we know with Central School, we're all big proponents of getting, um, you know, modifications to the school, renovations done. Um, we knew the HVAC there is, I say, lagging, as uh, that's probably the best word to use right now. Is there anything that we've done to that over the summer and being prepared for this coming up? In oh, the I, th Dave, that's a great question. And we actually um, have. Um, there have been situations where the systems that we have were understood to be, for example, we have exhausts throughout the building. Those exhausts were understood to be um, gravity-fed exhausts. And when we looked into the um, systems to make sure that we're maximizing the capabilities of the systems, um, there have been situations where a motor had not been uh, operational, right, to create a power bend. And so um, the exhaust systems that we've had in place that we, again, um, had for long presumed to be gravity fed were actually um, motor driven and those motors have been uh, replaced. We're going through the process of making sure that those are um, in, in good working order to make sure that the system that we have, although not optimal, um, is working to the best of, of our um, existing capabilities. And once we have the assessments uh, done, recommendations can be made if, if possible to improve the systems that we have. But certainly we're not going to get a good read on the systems that we have until we're you know 100% certain that all of our existing technology is working to its greatest capability, which is we're, we're, we're pretty close to that at this point. Okay. So it's a little, little bit of a different, um, I think, experience for people who are in, the, in that building on a, on a regular basis. I think it's a little bit different than what we've seen in the past in terms of air quality. I think it's obviously taking a, a, a much more prominent role. And so I think that I think we'll be um, surprised with, with what the capabilities are when that system is fully operational. Okay. Um, I think my next question and kind of commentary is a little bit bigger of a topic. And it's something that I've been asking for and trying to understand is, you know, I hear the words we want to be safe, which is, I think everybody's aligned to. I know everybody agrees we need to do this safe. I've heard safe as possible, more safe. Um, what I'm trying to understand is what does that mean in, for the community, for the teachers? What is that definition? Um, you know, it really goes into what is the data behind we should be in this phase one, what are the data points for phase two to say, are we meeting those or do we have to pull back? And I know it's hard to get to those answers sometimes, but 
some of the things we've already heard is, is around data, like 200 Chromebooks. Okay, let's get that. HVAC assessment. Okay, let's get that. Um, what other adjustments, if we're going to use the CDC guidelines, and we as the uh, school board have reserved money to help to increase this, meaning if, it, if we need to do uh, tents, if we need to do uh, transition stuff into the gymnasium, the, the cafeterias, and use those as classrooms, what are some of those criteria you're using for the phase one versus phase two that we can say we're meeting those or we can prepare it and say we're not and what do we do about them? Mike, can you, uh, you want me to take this? No, both of us can. It, you, you know, it, it's, we have the, the things that you've mentioned and we've talked about how much you've supported us. We have looked into tents. But then we also talk about having now an open campus. Well, we've just tried to do closed campuses and closed doors. So it seems like through this process, a lot of the things are when one door, uh, you know, a lot of the unintended consequences. I think we'd all buy a tent and pitch it and the kids would love to learn outside along with the teachers. But then we have to go into how are we monitoring the campus for people coming on. Um, it's, it's, it, it is a constant um, problem solving i feel like it's a, every day there's a there's there's something else that we're trying to figure out a new way of attacking it we have we're redesigning exactly what we've been doing for so many years and trying to flip it on its head so when you talk about data points i think that's i think that's a collective discussion amongst you know as megan was saying it's it, it's a collective discussion amongst all of us what you know i i don't feel I don't feel like I should be the one person giving a number of what is the appropriate amount of cases of positive um, within a community or within Rockingham or within Southern New Hampshire. And then now it's okay to be full or not full. Um, I don't think there's one right answer. I, I mean, I'm just, now I'm being a little bit more honest on my, my personal side. I, I don't know the, the exact number. Um, yeah, and I agree with you, Mr. Flynn on that. It's, uh, it's unfortunate that this has been pushed down from, you know, federal to state to local in the manner that it has. Um, and it's an unfortunate situation we're all in that we have to come up with those numbers. I agree with you wholeheartedly on this. Well, just, just jumping in, I think, um, you know, in a, in a successful phase one in terms of safety, you know, I would say I would consider it successful if we have zero transmitted cases in Hampstead. I think another data point is this is an experiment for a lot of people. They haven't done it before. I think we're going to have data from surrounding towns that chose to, the experiment. And, um, that, that data will help us one way or the other. It'll, it'll either be a failed experiment in terms of jumping into hybrid too soon with lots of cases where then we say, well, geez, our conservative approach maybe saved us an awful lot of headaches and heartaches here in Hampstead. Or we may learn a lot from the people that chose to experiment with children and we'll be able to do something probably more creative. Um, you know, we're, we're working closely with, with both of our unions to make sure um, you know, we, we figure out what's the safest way to, to go about a learning plan. And, um, you know, we struggled with, with this same data. And, I, you know, Dave, you and I had, uh, you know, a, a conversation about, you know, what's going to trigger phase two. I think for me, you know, triggering phase two is we're going to know a lot more into that second, third week into the beginning of October about what we can and can't do and what's happened around us. So I think, I think that puts us in an advantageous position. I think, um, you know, what are the other benefits? I think we get better at remote learning. You know, we, in the event that we're forced back out, which most people believe um, that there'll be a resurgence and we will all be back into remote learning at some point in, in during flu season, uh, we'll have already established um, a solid part of what's, if this is a two headed coin, you know, the, the weaker of our two parts, you know, we do a great job in person and we need to work on our remote learning. So I think, you know, that may be an un unanticipated benefit or an anticipated benefit, depending on how you look at it. Um, but I think those data points, it's really hard to commit to something, you know, other than the fact that I, we are committed to getting to phase two as quickly as we possibly can. We are committed to, um, you know, figuring out a way to be creative with, with what we have in terms of a hybrid kind of thing. And our end goal really isn't phase two. Our end goal is really phase three about getting everybody back uh, to our new normal um, back in, into our schools. So I think that those are, those are important concepts. And, um, you know, we, we struggled with the same thing. We want what we want. Uh, we all want the same thing. Like we don't want different things. We all, but the one thing is we need to make sure that, that it's safe for both the staff and the students um, while we get to, you know, while we go on our path to try to get back to our desired outcome of everybody, um, you know, uh, 
together again, learning in our schools and, and enjoying each other's company. You know, and Megan brought up a good point, you know, that social emotional piece, you know, we're going to, we, we are, even in our remote version of this and, and into phase two, we, we're going to, we, 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 that's going to need to be addressed um, somehow, some way. We're going to need to find a way to reach. Um, and I think, you know, Mike didn't go into great detail about this, but that small group, those afternoons, I think, I think that's our opportunity to really get in and, and, and make sure that our social emotional well-being uh, with our kids is is being addressed. Um, you know, so uh, that that's that's really kind of where we are. I don't know if that answer is helpful or if that's even well, more. Yeah, I think for me, it's just uh, when you talk about struggling, that's where I struggle. Is you know, I'm more of a quantitative versus a qualitative. Saying quicker, safer, it, it to me, it's it's like I need you know defining measurements of that. You know, I, I think that in New Hampshire, we've been pretty lucky compared to the rest of the country. We've had a lot less um, than most um, states, and we're looking to be one of the, you know, in probably the best manner uh, we've been since last March, if, uh, you know, the latest data. So that's why I'm trying to understand how much safer can we get, you know, it, the zeros across the board. I'm just trying to understand that. It's hard for me to, uh, you know, commit for the community. How can we do this if we don't have that criteria? for the town, for the teachers, for the administration, everybody. No, the, well, the criteria for me on a personal level is one's too many. You know, one person in the hospital, one person sick because of a decision we made, that's too many, right? So that's not qualitative, that's quantitative in a lot of ways, but it's, it's kind of a qualitative approach in the sense of, well, that's too conservative, that's too sensitive. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think there's a lot we don't know. So I think you're right, there is data that we need that we don't have yet. Nobody has it yet. Even the schools that are deciding that they think they can do this hybrid thing right out of the, you know, in late August, they don't have the data either. Um, you know, they, they're just kind of rolling the dice. Um, uh, you know, yeah, my recommendation would be don't roll the dice, you know, watch other people's experiment, see what happens and, and then make informed decisions based on that data as well. You know, what's happening in Hampstead, but what else is happening around Hampstead? You know, Sam Bourne's doing the same thing we're doing. We talked to the superintendent today. They felt like that was, for different reasons, but doing the same thing that we're doing um, as far as a, a phase, you know, a, a safe entry uh, back into school and then and then looking at it the next phase. So, um, I don't know. It's... Caitlin? Yes. Um, yeah, I just want to say, you know, um, because of the point that David just made, which is a good point, the point is we don't have all the data. And because we don't have all the data, I think it's in our best interest and the best interest of our students and staff that we take the more cautious approach. Um, and we have to realize as school board members, we can't be everything to all people and we can't solve all the problems. For me, it's important that I just focus on what I feel is my main responsibility as a school board member. And that responsibility is to keep our students and staff as safe as possible um, and still continue on with, with learning. And under these circumstances, I really think that the physical well being of our students really has to take precedence over any emotional or social um, well being. That's not to say that we don't care about that. We do. It's even in one of our um, goals to look at the whole child. But under these circumstances, um, social and emotional well-being of our kids aren't going to matter if they get sick, if they're in the hospital, or if, you know, God forbid, one of them would die. So for me, um, the safety has to come first. Um, and just also to um, Megan's point about getting back to school, I just want, I want you to realize, I think that going back to school now is not gonna be like going back to school a year ago. Um, it, I don't, I, it's unrealistic, I think, to think that the kids are, would have even the same social and emotional experiences because there aren't gonna be the hugs. They're not gonna be able to hold hands walking down the hallway. They can't play together in small little groups out on the playground. All that welcoming and warmth that we think of when we go back to school just isn't possible right now. So 
that that's why you know I don't think we need to rush into that situation because that situation is going to look very differently than what we all have in our minds what school normally is. Um, I'm also concerned that if we're back in school, um, I'm not sure how much learning is actually going to take place in that the teachers are going to be policing their classrooms. If they're reminding the kids that, you know, don't get too close. Did you wash your hands? Put your mask back on. Um, I think a, a large part of the day is going to be policing um, all the protocols for the health. So I think that the this phased in approach that the task force works so hard on with our administrators and teachers, um, I think for now, with the information we have available to us, I think it is the best approach. It's a comprehensive, comprehensive approach. Um, and I support it 100%. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. Um, do we have any other questions or comments? I do. Okay, to, go ahead, Jim. I'd like to ask them all, actually. Um, yeah, no. So I'll, I'll, go go. Through, I'll go through them quickly. Um, uh, this is a comment, and I'm going to go in no particular order except the things I have written down. Um, the glaring it brings up a glaring issue that we have in Hampstead. Our buildings are falling apart. And I hope everybody remembers this when we think about the challenges to get our children back into school. It quite possibly we could have went to a hybrid day one if we had buildings that were matched what we want to do with education with our children. So hopefully people remember this if we ever bring up a bond in the future. Um, we have no flexibility in this school with space. Don't have air conditioning. We have many issues, stairways, hallways, bathrooms. We've said it before. So think back to the bonds in the past. This was, these weren't wish lists for the heck of it. Look at us now. We have no flexibility. We're going right into a remote, no hybrid. Um, and and our, our infrastructure is not what it should be. That's a comment. Um, the other comment I want to make, is, and Dr. Messler, please talk about this. And, and um, when you go to hybrid and you go back to talk about hybrid, parent responsibility, before they get their kids on the bus. I, know, I don't want to spend too much time on hybrid because because that you're going to go back to the table on that one. But parent responsibility, when they get those kids on the bus, you're not sending your kids sick. Um, you, you're doing whatever checklist that is advised to, to think about before you send your kid to school, temperature, this, that, you know, parent responsibility. I guess the other thing on the same topic is, I know teachers from the first three months of remote, they would be fielding questions at night, before school, after school, weekends. We need a, not only do we need a schedule for the children, but our teachers have home lives. They have children too. We need to have guidelines in, 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 that are set out for the parents on how they're gonna communicate to the teachers. Um, and the, the teachers cannot be teaching their kids at eight o'clock at night. I know it's unfortunate if some parents can't do certain schedules, but I, I don't think we can ask teachers to do some of what they did before. I'll stop now and let you answer that one or talk about that one. Well, well certainly, Jim, you know, you, you bring up good points. And so, you know, we're, we're, we're in this together. So it's a partnership, um, you know, the expectations for everybody there, you know, there's expectations for uh, staff and obviously expectations for families. You know, I, I alluded to it earlier, you know, our, our goal is to not have, you know, the parents feel like they have to be the teachers, but, you know, parents to be parents and, and in a supportive kind of role. But you are right. There's a, there's a responsible piece about this, you know, and in, in, in public schools, we deal with this, you know, um, sometimes sick, kill, sick children are sent to school and our nurses have to send them home. And uh, so we're going to ask parents to be vigilant, uh, you know, as we get to phase two, uh, that's going to be important because, you know, bad decisions, if, if people aren't responsible, I mean, we've seen this happen all over the country, you know, states that weren't responsible, uh, you know, numbers spiked pretty quickly, you know, and 
you know, I don't think anybody, you know, would expect us to know what the numbers are going to be like in September here or on the first week of August, right? So we're asking for data that we don't even have yet, right? So I think, you know, we're preparing, I think, to make sure that we're in the best spot possible that week of September 14th to do what we need to do, look at the data and then make an informed decision about phase two quickly. But um, you are you are right, you know, the schools are um, are working on that criteria about what the expectations will be from families, you know. Uh, I was talking to Dr. Powers at Pinkerton too. It's, you know, you're not going to be able to go back and forth. If you select all remote and then, you know, they're going to need some sort of notice. You know, you can't just, you know, are you taking the bus or not taking the bus? Um, it's going to be a lot that has to happen in terms of structure and in a situation where we've been fortunate, you know, um, for many years where we have a lot of flexibility and it's not as structured perhaps. And, you know, so that, that's, those are going to be some important, um, that's important criteria. And you bring up some really good points about, what, um, you know, what the parents, what the family's responsibility is going to be in terms of the partnership. And so school has responsibilities, you know, certainly the families will as well. And um, we'll, we'll work together. I think, um, you know, we talked about communication. That's going to be really, really important, um, you know, from the classroom teacher, from the building level, from the administration, certainly from the school board, uh, so that everybody's clear about what their expectations are. So, but thanks for those comments, Jim. We, we talked, thank you. We talked about wraparound services for the kids, food service, wireless internet. Um, I, I want to talk about what the teachers need. I don't know if the camera on their laptop at home is going to be good enough during remote or the, or the remote portions of hybrid to broadcast to the kids. Do they need better technology at home? Do they need a, a black drop? I'm not talking about screen, green screen and in like, you know, whatever. I'm just saying, you know, all I'm, all I'm trying to say, I want to make sure our teachers have what they need for remote. And it might not just be the camera that's on their laptop. It, it oh, yeah. could be some yeah. type of digital, you know, presentation technology. I'm not in that world, so I don't know. You know, yeah. in, in the we same respect, I, I just, I want to say one more thing. We, and I just want to make sure, you know, because I've been thinking about this, you know, maybe some teachers get together and it might be an opportunity to buy some content that's already made, you know, um, a, a module on long division that they say, hey, this is better than we can do. That can supplement what we're going to be doing. It's already made professionally. It's not that much money. It could be used for third grade, second grade, for years to come, possibly. So just some ideas I had. Sorry. Yeah, like, uh, in, in regards to this, oh, go ahead. Yeah, in regards to the staff technology, that that's the stuff that we've been working on since May. All that information was coming in from what happened in the spring, um, and then what you said specifically to to programs or or applications, uh, those have already been vetted, starting to begin vetted, um, so that as you said, we're, we're trying to accommodate and support our teachers who are trying to support the families. Um, so I, we, we, we are in good shape on the teacher side. Um, and, and certainly if, if any needs arise, we'll, we'll let you guys know. No, and Mike, just to add to that, you know, I've, I've heard from, from certainly enough families um, that made it crystal clear that the laptop camera is not good enough, that we, we need to do better. So that was really that work starting in May. So Jim, that's a good point. Um, and so we'll, you know, will everybody have, you know, a really expensive camera um probably not but will they be better than what we've used in the spring i certainly hope so mike <laughs> right so um yep. you know we need to take inventory and we need to make sure that staff has the equipment so i did talk a little bit about equipment and making sure that staff had the equipment it's it's more than just a mask right so it's the technology right. it's whatever equipment they need so um we don't have a well, let's say this is and i mean this in the most respect we don't have a shy staff when it comes to if they need something they'll ask for it and I, you know, and I know Kara will, um, as the president of HEA, will make sure she champions those efforts. And I know Lisa Lambert, as the president of HASC, she will make sure that she champions those efforts. And, you know, we want to hear from them if they don't feel like they have what they need. So um, I, I know that that communication um, exists and those lines are open and, um, you know, they've been working on it. So I think that's one box that you can check in terms of we will be in better shape uh, than we were last spring as far as what we need for equipment. Um, two more things, if you don't mind. One is, uh, do, do we need extra help in the technology department because of everything that's going to be going on? Teachers need help creating content, um, 
the families have a problem with Chromebook, um, all that stuff. I mean, so we, all I'm we, saying is I, I support what you guys need to get the job done the right way. That's what I'm saying. Appreciate that. We did. We did actually hire some summer help, uh, and, and helped us, you know, uh, re-image all of our our iPads, uh, update all the Chromebooks, that, that fix all the stuff that came in from remote. Um, so we did have temporary help, uh, and it's certainly something uh, as we move forward here, uh, depending on how long we are in each phase or however it may be, that we'll, we'll be managing the part-time help to make sure that we're supporting the families uh, who need it with with the devices. Excellent. Thank you. All right, two, I'm sorry, two more things now. I'm adding something else, I forgot. Um, the hybrid model, whether it be central school or middle school, will the kids move classrooms or will the teachers move and the kids stay in a classroom? In the initial planning currently um, of all the, the, the rough drafts we have, um, at the central school, you're gonna see the teachers be moving where the, uh, the students would be within the same classroom. Um, and then at the middle school, since it's a little bit of a different model with team and they have multiple teachers, uh, you'll probably see a little bit more of a pod model where, you know, eight or 10 kids will move uh, as eight or 10 kids throughout the day, um, rather than trying to move, uh, you know, the amount of staff that we have. Okay, great. Um, last, um, so the end of last year wrapped up pretty well, I think. And what I mean by that is, we had parades, central school, middle school, even the town was involved with birthday parades. Um, can you think about um, in, in, um, uh, something to start off the year? Uh, these kids have not seen their new teachers before, some of them. Some are going to middle school for the first time. Some are going to central school for the first time. Um, can we have an opportunity to have the parades again maybe smaller so they can spend an extra few seconds uh, maybe chatting with their teacher for 10 seconds and is there an opportunity to see the kids possibly that are in their class in person i don't know how that could happen i'm just free styling right now you know could could one class at a time go to the field behind town hall the teachers on stage saying hi the kids are all 15 feet apart with masks they could see one another. They could say what their name is, what they, the well, let me, color they like, or something. I'm just saying, um, let's kick off the year the right way. So, Jim, let me let me let me answer that just quickly. And and I know you know we've had had discussions. So the the short answer is yes. You know, um, uh, we got to talk with Principal Collins and Principal Denola about what's the best way to do this. But um, we're gonna we're gonna ask them like in the next two weeks. Let's get everything done before August 18th as far as all the schedules and how, you know, what the operations will look like. And then from the eighth, you know, that gives us several weeks to plan. All right, let's make this special, right? So if it's a parade, um, you know, I, I mean, I envisioned even going from phase one to phase two. Now I'm just thinking out loud, we haven't committed to this, you know, uh, those students that went, are going from four to five, you know, are they a day, are they there a day early? You know, are our, our students that are new to our, our school district, you know, as far as preschool, kindergarten, are they there a day early? I mean, are they in the building by themselves for a day, like their own kind of fly up transition day? So all those kinds of conversations will take place. But um, I have, I can't tell you, I have incredible confidence in, in that, you know, after watching, you know, Dillard, uh, Mr. Collins, Principal Collins conduct that parade. I mean, that was just incredible, right? So, you know, the details that need to be worked out to do something like that smoothly, um, he's, he's, uh, he's special when it comes to that. So I think, you know, between the two of them and their staffs, we'll be able to welcome kids back in, in a, in a really creative, clever way. So if it's a parade or whatever it might be, or if it's class by class, let's let them figure that out and plan that. And that'll be part of, um, part of that, that next stage after we get the, um, the actual schedules done. Thank you. Last thing. Okay. Yep. Um, a statement followed by a question. So, you know, I just, um, I do appreciate, you know, everyone's uh, inputs to this and everybody's, you know, the plan recommendation. I do think we missed an opportunity here of, um, you know, not enough attention on kids and parents. I think that there's a lot um, this town has had to say um, about what they want. And I think that with the town seeing that their high school students are going to a hybrid model, 
they're wondering what it is that they saw that they could do a hybrid model and we couldn't um, right out of the gate. Um, so that's the statement. Um, the question is more of a concern I have, which is the targeting of October timeframe. And we know that's when flu season starts. Are we gonna be adequately prepared to handle kids having the flu, this other thing that we're saying is really hard to detect and that we're really hard to um, have the data behind. I have concerns that we'll never get to that hybrid model because we'll be in the, the start of the flu season at that point. Do we have a plan or have you been talking to other school districts how they're gonna be prepared to do that so we can leverage how uh, that, that learning, that knowledge? The, those are can you can you just i just want to can you specifically ask that were you saying do we have a plan for when flu and cold season come around in connection with covid correct like okay how are we going to be prepared for that on top of this other thing it seems like it's a it's a almost um if we're concerned well we're concerned about one but we know that that time frame of mid-october is right when flu season starts up it's going to be really hard to detect which one's which yeah, so in regards to the, the CDC guidelines in regards to COVID and determining whether it, it, it's, it is COVID or not, uh, there are things out there, and again, this is, this is part of the phase two in the screening and the procedures. There are things out there that say, you know, students or staff should show two, po uh, excuse me, two negative tests before returning to school. Um, so all of that, the the guidelines or the principles for us making those decisions on whether someone has a common cold or a flu, um, those will be outlined in the procedures and practices that will be happening within the school. Um, it, David, it's coming back to that. It, it's coming back to that, that situation where we, we don't know that answer yet. We haven't lived through COVID and flu at the same time. We haven't lived through all these things coming together at once, but we're, we want, we want to determine, as you said, we want to separate positive, real COVID from flu or cold uh, and create a safe and healthy learning environment. Maybe, maybe all the extra hygiene and social practices we're putting in place um, curves the flu and we don't see the flu the way it comes around. These are all, these are all the things I don't, I mean, I don't have that answer to, but. Yeah, I, Mike, I have the answer. I've spoken to the districts. Nobody has that answer yet. We haven't, we haven't, no one's, it hasn't happened yet. So that's, that's a to be determined. Okay, thank you. Okay, do we have any other comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, I am going to ask um, Melissa to call the roll. For the, oh, sorry, wait, Megan's hand is raised. Oh, Mike, I think she's, she's muted. muted. Yeah, one second. Sorry. I'd like to say something when she's done too. Okay, we'll go to Megan well, first. And then. We got another thing. Okay. All right, no, I don't have anything to say. Um, I muted myself because I, I don't know if you could hear the wind. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, ahead. not at your house, at my oh. house. I can't. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Jim. I know UA is going to be a part of the Zoom classes for remote, I just want to make sure, well, I'm asking, because I don't think technically Ventures is a part of UA, but um, is, is Ventures going to be part of remote and hybrid? Remote? Yes. Yeah, that, yeah. Was a, that was the main focus of the task force, without a doubt. We have two outstanding Ventures teachers, and uh, we want them to be as creative and, and as they possibly can and make sure that they you know, make sure that their programs thrive, you know, remotely in a hybrid version and, and really when we get back. So uh, we're really excited. We want to make sure that they, they have that opportunity. So, you know, Mike's working with them. Um, they'll, we'll get that done. Great. Sorry, it was a question that I missed. Thank you. Okay. Um, anyone else? I don't want to cut anyone off before we go to um, calling the question. Okay, seeing none, um, Melissa, will you please call the roll vote? I think she's muted. Pretty sure I got to unmute her yet. <clears throat> okay. 
I have unmuted her. Go Thank ahead, you. Melissa. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Malcolm. No. Mrs. Parnell. Yes. Mr. Smith. No. Mr. Sweeney. Yes. Mrs. Yusenka. Yes. Okay, motion carries, three, two. Okay, thank you. Okay, unless we have anything else, I know it's late, but board members, I do need to ask for a non-public, um, as I mentioned to all of you. Um, before I ask for it, members of the public who are here, we are not making any decisions. Um, so although you're welcome to wait, um, we're not making any decisions. This is not, also has nothing to do with remote learning or anything or safe learning. And uh, so you're welcome to stick around, but we'll be coming back and adjourning directly from there. So. Um, I would like a motion to go into non-public under 91A colon three section C and L. No moved. Okay. okay. Melissa, will you please pull the board? Ms. Malcolm? Yes. Mrs. Parnell? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Sweeney? Yes. Mrs. Yusenka? Yes. Okay. Motion carries. It's 10 03. I just need Thank a second you. because of yep. the amount of people in here. Yep. Melissa, I'll be asking you to come in as well. Please. Okay. Take a little break. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> 